Now, there are several causes that have been proposed for the Little Ice Age, including the decrease in human population emerging in the Americas upon European contact. So what happened in this period of time they're calling 1300 to 1850? What happened that froze America? Several causes have been proposed. <laughs> Cyclical loads and solar radiation. Uh, we got heightened volcanic activity, changes in the ocean circulation, variations in the Earth's orbit, <laughs> axial tilt, climate change, global climate, right? Decreases in human population. Let's stay with this. Such as by the massacres of Genghis Khan? What has Genghis Khan got to do with the Black Death plague in Europe? And the epidemics emerging in the Americas, man. It, it was so cold in the Americas, man. They call it the... <laughs> Coldest period. One of the coldest period in the last 100 years, excuse me, 1,000 years. So when these hijacks came to America, we got to get our minds straight as we get orientation pies and orientation enchiladas. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're talking President John, man. We're talking ice ages. We're talking technological you know what I'm saying? Oppression. You know what I mean? Like, these are not natural occurrences. This is some type of technology. Something happened. Something happened, man. <laughs> when these hijacks got here, they found North America, the North America, they thought, it's going to have the same climate as Europe. But they said this northern United States had hotter summers and colder winters than Europe. That effect was aggravated by the Little Ice Age and unpreparedness led to the collapse of many early European settlements in North America. So... When these hijacks, and you know what they look like, because they look like you, right? <laughs> Black ass King Charles, right? So when they came here, man, they came to the freezing tundra. It was the coldest period. When these colonists settled at Jamestown, it was one of the coldest periods in the last 1,000 years. Drought was also a problem <laughs> in North America. So... This is an American problem, but everybody felt this, man. This, this to me, is the real Ice Age, man, the big Ice Age. <laughs> but they want to call it little just to throw you off, man, because it was the largest drought in the past 800 years, according to the University of Arkansas, right? Crazy. So what happened, man, between this? It says there is no census on when the Little Ice Age began, but a series of events before the known climatic minima have often been referenced. In the 13th century, packed ice began advancing southwards in the North Atlantic as did glaciers in Greenland. Is this when... Is this when Greenland froze over, supposedly. Is this when Antarctica froze over, my nigga? Because we know there ain't no ice on Antarctica's chest ball. 
and there's glaciation lines. Remember that map we show with the Ishmaelites migrating, walking around their holy mountain of harmonics, man? What did that so-called holy mountain of harmonics, what did that cue, what, did, what kind of harmonics? <laughs> you know, harmonics is everything. Vibration is everything. What kind of vibration did they put walking around this cue or, you know, whatever energy was in this cue? What kind of artificial Atlantean vibration did they put on America that put it into an ice age? For like 500 years, man. It's crazy because they were looking for Preston John for 500 years. 1145 to 1605. And during that time, it's an ice age, boss. 16th century to 19th century. This is all during the time they finding you, right? So something happened <laughs> that might have something to do with the genocide in America. European contact. Something to do with Genghis Khan, perhaps. <laughs> Come on, man. Hey, man. Yeah, we just popping off. Hey, shout out to all the fire starters keeping the fire burning, man. And, you know, all the nuggets dropping. You know what I'm saying? All the drop you dropping. Just, just know, man. <laughs> When it comes to popping off with you, there's only one way to do it, man. There's only one way to do it, man. Is that's to come from the heart bone and pop off. Because this is the Preston <laughs> Investigation. Yeah, man. Uh, uh, gotta come from the heart bone, man. We do this. You know what I'm saying? For the AI, Manak, we do this for a while. We do this for the Kanda we, man. Because we got to look. We got to search, man. Hosea 3. History is not always what one has been taught to believe has happened in the past. Emmanuel Velaskovsky demonstrated this point convincingly in his numerous works. Australia's history before British colonization is a case in point. Overcoming the blindness engendered by the scientific errors of uniform materian and Darwinian evolution opens up a whole new way of looking at the past. The theories of uniformitarianism and Darwinism evolution masquerades as science, but they are really science fantasies. Yeah. Using the faculty dating methodologies based on evolutionary assumptions that sea change is very slow and gradual causes problems of immense proportions. This has led to an overly critical approach to many literary and historical sources. Emmanuel Velaskovsky's writings has led to a revival in some quarters of the older form of understanding geology, that of catastrophism. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that word, catastrophism? So let's talk about the catastrophe. What happened during the Little Ice Age, my not? What popped it off, right? Because this has everything to do with your story. You better figure this out because history repeats itself, they say, right? <laughs> you better figure this out. We better figure this out, right? So a great catastrophe occurred in the Southern Hemisphere, 1530 AD, which changed that hemisphere drastically. It was the last in a line of catastrophes to hit the world. This was the last great catastrophe. Although we heard about this 1811, 1812, the Kumse Comet, uh, this earthquake that happened around that time too. So catastrophe in the 1500s, catastrophe again in the 1800s. Is this something to do with the timelines? Remember the three major chronological time shifts and a totally for the main code. We're going to get it again. We're going to get it again, boss. 333 years, 1,054 years, and 1,778 years. On average, these are 
the major chronological time shift. So you can always, in your investigation, feel free, my naga, to shift time around to see what fits in the puzzle, in your puzzle, in your investigation, right? So if we see 1500, we can shift it back to 1800, or we can shift it the other way to uh, 1200s, right? Now we're right in the midst of the Genghis Khan flow, <laughs> 13th century flow. And they said this thing, this little ice age started, you know, well, they say they don't, they don't really know, but they have different dates, right? 1300 uh, to 1850, but this is very loose. And now when they talk global warming, we understand that you were still in the ice age about 150 years ago. So, of course, the earth is warming up. Fool, you just got out the ice age, man. 1300, though. It's very close to 1200s. <laughs> Where Genghis Khan is popping off, right? And we don't have to stick hard on the 1300 since they admit to us that they don't really know. There is no consensus on when the Little Ice Age began. Then they said in the 13th century, pack ice started to advance and all this. So, 13th century, my naga is 1200s. So now we're right back to Preston John and the war with Genghis Khan, which happened around 1202, 1203. The Genghis Khan takeover was, was in full effect, and you know, the early 1200s, you know what I'm saying? Uh, 13th century, right? What happened? <laughs> what are the suggestions again? S several causes, C cyclical cyclical lows and solar radiation. So they didn't get no sun. Heightened volcanic activity, changes in ocean circulation. That means the water reverse, man, like the Mississippi running backwards, right? Like a polar shift. But they're going to say the Earth orbit and axial tilt hijacks it. But it had to be something so drastic, so catastrophic. Inherent variability in global climate decreases human population, right? Such as the massacres by Genghis Khan, Black Death, and epidemics emerging in the Americas upon hijack contact. Genghis Khan, right? So they put Genghis Khan right in the midst. In the equation, they throwing Genghis Khan on the table <laughs> as a possible cause of the Little Ice Age, my naga. They're saying it's possible. They are saying it's possible that Genghis Khan popped off the Little Ice <laughs> Or just all these hijacks from Europe coming over that look like us, right? That look like us. Catastrophism, word of the day. A great catastrophe occurred in the Southern Hemisphere 1530, which changed that hemisphere dramatically. It was the last in the line of catastrophes to hit the world. It was the events of 1530 AD that froze Antarctica, Monaga. So it's not just my own independent theory that the Little Ice Age is the Big Ice Age, because it must be the Big Ice Age if it froze Antarctica, boss. They say the Ice Age is way back in the BCs. No, my naga, it just happened. And they're just getting out of it, which is why you're getting global warming. It was the events of 1530 AD that froze Antarctica caused <laughs> the... <laughs> I can't make this up. I can't make this stuff up. So they're saying the same thing we say. This independent researcher is saying the same thing we say in our investigation in Drive Nation, my not. <laughs> we saying that this little ice age is the big ice age. They're saying, yeah, this ice age caused Antarctica to freeze over. So it must have also caused these glaciation lines and all this stuff in America, right? And one of the reasons could be Genghis Khan in there. Or the European contact, which is really all the same damn thing, because you're talking about the same confederacy of Moors, Moab, and 
more and more war. European, right? Drastically changed the coastline of Australia, which originally Australia is, Australia is Antarctica. They just changed it recently, right? So it just means southerly continent. Southerly. Australia just means southerly. So this is Antarctica. Huge tsunamis hit Australia and New Zealand, sunk many lands and islands into the Indian and Pacific Oceans and led to great movements of people. Movement of the people. Exodus, my God. Earlier in the great catastrophe of about 535 AD, where two celestial objects hit the Gulf of Carpentaria or Northern Australia, parts of the coastline sunk in Australia and much land sunk under the water east of Australia, leaving many New Zealand, mainly, mainly New Zealand behind and caused the many ice age, they say. In the Northern Hemisphere, which destroyed the Arthurian Empire. And according to Keegan Brewer and President John Legend and his sources, it claims that this Arthur, Arthurian Empire is the Empire of King David or Prester John. And that this Arthurian genealogy is completely false and made up to cover, you know, the real thing, which is. The Preston John genealogy. They created author, and author just means order. <laughs> so who's the con of the order? You're back to the priest king. So this order empire was destroyed by this ice age and sunk the Alfarian islands or these order islands <laughs> these cons in Lyon southwest of Cornwall Lachlan Long Laughlin northwest of Ireland all these are Nagas because Benjamin Franklin already told us in 1751 observation of mankind that the Irish and the Scottish and you know the Italians and the Spanish they're all swarthy they're all so-called black people and that's what Benjamin Franklin says in his essay. So we ain't tripping, boss. All these Nagas were destroyed because of this technological weapon, <laughs> this mountain of harmonics, this, you know, uh, frequency war, man. Sometime around 700 to 500 BC, a further time of catastrophe occurred in which much of Southeast Asia, Sunderland, went under the waters and a portion of the fleeing lost Israelites, Exodus, eventually settled in Australia. Or are we talking Tarazakta? <laughs> are we talking Antarctica? Australia's map hold <laughs> let's just put it here for them then let's help them out Help these hijacks out. Terror Australia's. It just means Southern Lamb and I, right? And they call it a hypoth <laughs> hypothetical cut. So in other words, this, this is not your Australia today, right? This is just 
a term they're using for Southern land, back to the mythological flow. Whenever they do this, you already know they're covering our real history. So, hypothetical Southern land, my nigga. All right, worlds beyond the poles, you might as well call it. First posited in antiquity and which appeared on maps between 15 and 18th century. Is that something? Ain't that the exact same time period we're talking about with the Little Ice Age? Fifteenth century, sixteenth century to nineteenth century. Ain't that fifteen hundreds to eighteen hundreds, boss? Fifteenth century, fourteen hundreds, right? Thirteen hundreds. They say it might have started in the thirteen hundreds, <laughs> right? So, all right, <laughs> we ain't no, we ain't on a play, play, man. This theory of balancing land has been documented as early as the 5th century on the Macrobius, which uses the term Australius on his map. So, I want to put it in your mind, Bone, when you see Australia in the 15th century, this is Australia. And now when I say an article to these people, right? They're just thinking about little an article like this, right? <laughs> but even that is called fuego, which means hot. So you ain't talking about nothing cold. It's the land of the hotness, man. Talking dragons. Now compare this an article this little piece to what it really is. And what is that? What does this map remind you of? You see how South America touches <laughs> and it's still called Terra Fuego. Hot, 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 hot. Do I need to look up the definition of Fuego? <laughs> Uh, now, what does this remind us of? I mean, what was over here in the Tarazanta map, right? What does this remind us of? Tarazanta, wow. best investigation of all time because <laughs> when you uncover these uh, catastrophes disasters it all starts to overlap around this ice age time period this Amazonia we're going to talk high Amazon Queens and we're going to talk about their seat in Antarctica remember that so we got to talk Prestas and we got to talk, you know, our beautiful high Amazon queens, you know what I'm saying? Which are also priests, are also Prestas. Lady Prestas on the wall, Lady Dragons, hey, out to my aquas. So you see what they're hiding, right? This is love to the ox, that cow, that cool. Look at all the land of Australia's, right? But very detailed and mapped out here. Very rare map. And this land over here says Tarazanta. And you put in the meaning of Tarazanta, and you're going to get Holy Land. And you got to say, Holy Land? Yeah. What does it got to do with Israel? What does Australia have to do with Israel? What does Australia have to do with Israel? What does this hypothetical, mythological southern land have to do with Israel and the Holy Land? What's underneath the ice in Antarctica. What does Antarctica got to do with Holy Land and Israel, my nugget? What's under that ice for a nugget? When Hawaii says, I'll bring you back to your land, <laughs> do you know how much land the nuggets got? Has a part of your land been preserved 
for you. So look at Australia's on this map, right? Look at Australia's on this map. We just found <laughs> very similar in the layout to the Taurus Act. South America touching, you know, <laughs> same spot. Look at the gateways, though, where you can get out of the wall, right? The barrier. This one doesn't show, you know, all the same gateways, but it does kind of show <laughs> openings. It just doesn't show it going all the way through, right? But pay attention to this opening here, these openings here, and kind of compare them a little bit. So it's almost like they're giving us this one to the left of South America. But the gateway to the right of South America, they ain't going to show us that, boss, right? <laughs> they going to give us the one to the left. They ain't going to give us the one to the right. Australia's got it. And then they just hid the land completely, man. They just said, uh, we'll just put a speck of land. <laughs> we'll put a speck and call it Fuego. But man, what happened to the fuego, right? I mean, what what happened to all the hotness? So when they say Australia, man, you you know we're talking about southern land or Sunderland, which means southerly land. And they're saying went under so part of this land went underwater, they're saying, and a portion of the fleeing lost Israelites eventually settled in Australia. Okay, so the Southeast Asia went underwater. Gotcha. Take our time. Let's take our time. Orient is finds map 1531 again. Gotta use all these references, man. Hey, 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 it's just here for us. So when we hear Asia, I don't know Southeast Asia, and then I hear Western Asia. So we gotta figure out which Asia. We gotta decode. Hijackville, right? So, but we do see Asia, Cathay, Perry, Perry, Paris, <laughs> Florida, right? Con, Asia. So, you think real Asia, you better be thinking America. When you think Australia, you better be thinking Antarctica, which connects directly to America. We on a warpath. <laughs> so parts of the Southeast Asia territory went underwater, and a portion of the fleeing lost Israelites eventually settled in Australia's or Tara Zakta. Wow. Which makes sense because it's fuego, it's hot, right? It's probably tropical. <laughs> it got the own sun. <laughs> Um, and they got gateways in and out this piece. We still got to deal with, on the Moron Moroni flow because all this deals with the Mormon flow. Mormon and Moron and all these Moronis is all in the Mormon flow, right? <laughs> yeah, boy. And the Mormons came to Utah, Judah, right? Because they know what's up with these children of Israel. They. <laughs> They know what's up. Let's go. Let's keep going. It's getting good. Fleeing lost Israelites settled in Australia from the Davidic kingdom of Qadar. You put a C instead of a K, you got cedar. <laughs> Davidic kingdom of 
Cedar or Godard. In Southwest, <laughs> now we got to go to the Southwest, right? Come on, man. Remember the sweat hypothesis? <laughs> Who remembers the sweat hypothesis, man? Come on, my nuggets. Sweat hypothesis. City. They don't want to show us the sweat. Hypothesis. Come on, man. Stop playing. Uh, come on, man. Sweat, S W E A T, which stands for Southwest, right? They just said something about Southwest that triggered the sweat hypothesis in my mind, Paul. That the Davidic kingdom of Qadar in Southwest, Western Australia, an exodus of the Mu. The Mu Nagas? Okay. Okay. Ooh, ah, ooh, ooh, ah. <laughs> yeah, man. Lost land believed to have been located somewhere in either the south, eastern, or southern, excuse me, Pacific or Indian Ocean. So there was a migration from Mu or Lemuria And are they migrating directly from Mu to Tarazakta? Well, that kind of lines up with the orientation. Of Tarzant. Because notice how Tarzant is kind of in line with the Pacific Ocean, right? So this massive land here, they can easily be migrating directly to this Fuego hot land, holy land, Tarzant. Right? <laughs> or they can come through America, right? So we got the orientation, right? When we talk Mu, Lemuria. Southwest. Hypothesis that the southwestern United States was at one time connected to East Antarctica. Boss, I'm out of here, baby. This is a pre-Cambrian fit of Western North America with the Australia Antarctic Shield. What? Did you say Southwest United States connects to Antarctica? <laughs> and now we're talking about migrations from Mu, right? And we keep saying we ain't from Africa. And they keep saying, well, uh, Evolution, evolution, right? Darwin, Darwin. We keep saying we are in the Far East. <laughs> they flip the map. They telling us we from Africa. So Moses, <laughs> Abraham, these Hebrews seem to have been connected with these lands in the Far East, Pacific, Mula, Mary type flow. Atlantis. Is a straight up hijack. 
man-made island. Poseidon hooked it up. And Poseidon's son, Atlas, was the original pharaoh or, you know, Nesut, king of Atlantis. Or Atlas, right? Multiple Atlases become Atlantis islands or Poseidon's son's islands. Like Anand ben David is David's son, and now you got Antioch, right? Hawaii destroyed Atlantis because of all this hijack. Then comes the dynasties coming out of Atlantis, which are the Egyptians, right? And they carried the same sun god energy, the same dualities, thoughtisms, and all this stuff, right? So that bled into our religions today, Sun God, Sunday, all this stuff. So all this hijack is popping off from, you know, these OG Atlantean hijacks. But our people, our priesthood is rocking out this Mu flow. This Mu is where the original Muans or Mu, they say Moors, but you're talking Muans, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We the Muans, man. Okay. So yeah, Tarzanta would be over, you know, around this area here. Go back, go back. Let me get. Okay, we good, man. So, you know, yeah. So this is the Ortelius World Map 1570. And again, we're always staying in the 1500s for the most part with these maps. Fifteen seventy, you're gonna, you know, fifteen hundreds, you're gonna get a lot closer to the real spiel. Ortelius or uh, Orientis Orantius finds fifteen thirty. Let's go. Southwest, right? Southwest, just like the sweat hypothesis, letting us know. That there's a connection. Between the southwestern United States, that's what, Four Corners, Grand Canyon, <laughs> Arizona, Utah, all that, Colorado, has a connection with Antarctica, man. And that also has a connection with Promised Land, right? So all this is happening. It has to do with this Davidic kingdom of Qadar in southwest western Australia or Antarctica an exodus of the Mu or Ma Meshwesh or Melishian what is the Mesh got to do with Meshe Moshe we are talking exodus what's that got to do with Meshe Moshe Moved to Asia May Minor and Egypt. These were the ancestors of the Gaelic speaking people of the British Isles and Ireland. So these are all Nagas and they connect with Israel. Which is when, you know, Tukumse was tribing up with the British and the um, you know, the Kumse War and all that, Revolutionary War, they call it. He was tribing up, the Kumse and they were tribing up with the British against the hijack 
American army, right? So-called American, right? So, but these Brits that they were, these Brit, Brit means covenant, first of all. So the people he was traveling up with most likely were still melanated Israelites, man. Because all of them, like Benjamin Franklin says, are swarthy. So the Qadarite kingdom was part of a Hebrew, Phoenician, Egyptian colony in Australia. Wow. Kind of reminds me of what they said about the lost tribe of Anros. <laughs> How it connects to this Scotia, Princess Scotia of Egypt. Princess Tamar, which we're about to dig on some Tamar flow. And it goes into these isles, right? Lady Andrews of Clan Seol Andreas of the ancient and noble house of Andrews Andreas Ptolemy, Egypt, <laughs> Greek, Iberian, Hebrews. Bang! California, Andrews Island. <laughs> All this has a Hebrew flair to it when you, you know, peel back the layers, right? So they're calling this house of Andros connected with the Hebrews, the Iberian, Greek, Egypt, because we know the Hebrews were in Egypt. And, you know, all this Israel has an undertone in all this, man, when you peel back the layers. And they're saying, this is a Hebrew, <laughs> Phoenician, <laughs> Egyptian situation. Hebrew, Iberian, Greek, Egyptian situation. Where's Phoenicia, by the way? Horizontal, wow, where's Phoenicia? <laughs> Let me know if you see it before me. I know I saw it down here in Tarzanta. Where's it at? Where's it at? This is interesting because this is a slightly different one. Um, I got like a couple of different other ones. This one right here, I don't see the Phoenicia on. It's interesting. I see Virginia. <laughs> Morania, Morania. Oh, that's interesting. Are they hiding the Phoenicia on this trap? I gotta pull up the other one then. Hey, I didn't know any separation, but now I see clearly. So we got to understand this connection between this Hebrew Phoenicia, especially when we're talking about Australia's. Let go. All right, all right. We good. Taurus out the wild. I had to go, I had to go back in the crates, man. Because I knew I wasn't tripping. Because we talk Phoenicia, it's right there, man. All right. <laughs> it's right there by the gateway, God. Phoenicia, Phoenicia. So it's crazy that they kind of blocked it out on this other map. And this was a newer one I had pulled up. Ah, look at that. It'll be right there. Why take Phoenicia off the map, man? 
why take Phoenicia off the map, man? They didn't take much else off this map. Why take Phoenicia off the map? Right? It'll be right there. That's crazy. It's crazy talk. But here it is, right? Okay, okay. I knew we seen Phoenicia. <laughs> Let's go. And, uh, you know, again, when we talk Tara Zonkton, Tara Zonkton, wow. Droplets popping off. We talk Tarzanta, yeah, in the German English dictionary. Tarzanta means what? Khan. Holy land or Israel. So why, oh why, is Australia or Antarctica called Tara Zant? And next to it is Phoenicia. In between the gateways, Tara Zant the well. So, I ain't making this up. Right, and even in their later maps, right, after the 1500s, they switched it over to, to Israel, you know, over there, right? And even their maps of Palestine and Holy Land, you know, they still got Taurus Octa. Tarzan the wow. So it's still Holy Land. And it's like, oh, where, where Jesus walked? No, they put the JC on it now, right? But Tarzan is still Tarzan. Holy Land. But now they switched up the Holy Land, of course. But what has it got to do? <laughs> What's it got to do with Australia? What's it got to do with America? What's it got to do with Antarctica and Phoenicia? Or the lost tribes of the roots, right? And roots, since we're talking a lot of Russia today, right? So Ptolemy, Egypt, Greek, Iberian, Hebrews, or as they're being called over here. Hebrew Phoenician. And that's why I had to say, so where is Phoenicia? Keep reading. So we're talking Australia, Antarctica, Tarzanta. <laughs> now Queen Hot Shet Suit, King Solomon, and Prince Nathan play an important role in this revised history of ancient Australia. Around this time, 600 BC, the so called Dogger Land, Darthish, Darth. Shish, surrounding the British Isles, was hit by a tsunami that sunk much of the land into the sea. Darshis was an advanced Egypto. <laughs> Here we go again, Hebrew, Phoenician, right? Colony, or we're just talking about the promised land, right? <laughs> Known for its great merchant ships. And again, when they talk Solomon, we already... Have a reference to Sylvanus told Texas, Solomon the Builder, 775, all that stuff. Kalelus, 
America. Love to Daniel Lowe, Forbidden Histories of America. Some Jewish sources refer to these ships of Tarshish with the Dutch ships, ships of Zebulon. So they're connecting this with the Hebrews, my life. Zebulon is connecting with the stars just by, according to his research. You know, you do the recon <laughs> on their recon. In Jewish legends, the Tarshishim are known as angels due to their, come on, <laughs> long blonde hair and tall stature. <laughs> in their legends, in the Jewish legends. But how about the legends of the Judah? Are they still with long blonde hair? Did they get changed to long blonde hair? Same way y'all taking Phoenicia off the maps and switching up Tarzan to the other side. <laughs> and of course, you know, you want to switch up all definitions and all images and the European and turns to this. And everyone turns to something else now. We are going to talk some China too. We're going to talk some China. But let's stay focused, man. Hat Shepsut Hepzipa Ma'at Kare was the daughter of Tut Moses the first and Queen Amoses, Amose, meaning child of the moon. Hot Shepsu was the high queen of Egypt, Cush, Sheba, Kadar, in the land of Mu. She came of a long line of moon or Mu queens. Thebes was called Washit, Washi, which can also be read she wa or she va or she ba, which again lets us know in the Hindu flow that it's also hijacked because they've turned Sheba, Queen Sheba, <laughs> into their goddess of destruction, Shiva, right? Which is just Shawa. <laughs> it is near Thebes that the great temple of Hat Shepsut is found. Now they say Queen of Egypt, Kush, and all that. This doesn't mean she's Egyptian. We had, um, you know, Hebrew pharaohs and all that stuff as well. And again, it reminds me of the Lady Andrews flow because they're bringing it right into the Egypt, Greek, Iberian, Hebrew flow. So when you see Egypt, don't get thrown off thinking that, you know what I mean? No, we're still talking Rus, we're still talking Mu. We're still talking the lost tribes. Don't let them throw you off, God. <laughs> you might hear my droplets pop from all lockers, but you know, this is it's like my fifth or sixth time recording this because they kept jamming up um, you know, the recordings, so <laughs> I had to wait, you know, a little longer. So um, you know, excuse my droplets, but hey, it's all happening. <laughs> All right, so Hatshepsut married King Solomon's brother Nathan, Nehese Narada, who became the royal governor of the Rodan Empire. Roda, right? Now they got Rhode Island today, but originally this was Rhoda, the kingdom in Arizona, Monaco, back to the southwest. Back to Antarctica. <laughs> Back to Mu. King of Dadan and Kadar. When Nathan died childless, she went to Israel to fulfill the custom of Vibum, raising up a son to the name of his childless brother with Nathan's oldest brother, Solomon. They had a son, Matata, or Natata, or Narada, who was the ancestor of the Virgin Mary, or are we saying Miriam, like the Quran says, you know, it's not Jesus and Mary, but it's Joshua and Miriam. Is Joshua in the scriptures the son of Moses' sister, Miriam? For real, for real. Is this why Moses was so close with Joshua? Is this why Moses laid his hands on Joshua when he was taking his dying breath in Deuteronomy 34, which of course we know his eyes his eyes was never dim, <laughs> nor was his life force abated or lessened or you know um, 
reversed, right? It's his life force was always there, so he never really died because <laughs> his life force never left. So we're putting this together. Is this Mary or Maryam, right? Her daughter Neferuri or Nenuna, Netuna with Solomon Senmut was reared by her in Egypt, the great city of Ophir or Safir, called the city of gold. Cities of gold was built at the mouth of a great flowing river from a huge canyon bigger than the Grand Canyon in America. Or is it the Grand Canyon in America? I can't make this up. They bring an America into this. <laughs> Another place that has been said to have been settled by Egyptian, Phoenician, Israelites. Okay. <laughs> so the Grand Canyon was also settled by Israel, my naga. And yeah, it has connection with the Egypt Phoenician flow because <laughs> we all have connection with the Phoenician and the Egyptian flow in the sense that, you know, when you're living in a kingdom, you know, they will call you Egyptian. When, when the Israelites moved to Goshen, you know what I mean, and moved to Egypt in the scriptures, you know, the Bible was like, they will be considered by some Egyptians based on them living in Egypt. Or if, if you're in the kingdom of Babylon, they will call you Babylonian. They'll call you African-American because <laughs> you're living in so-called, um, you know, their version of America, right? So ancient accounts spoke of the house as being on stilts and bee, beehive shape in a land of great valleys or canyons. The whole area was destroyed and sunk into the sea at a later date. Along with much as this land of Mu or Sheba or Punt. Y'all might have to say this with me, man. Um, I mean, I wasn't going to do this today. I wasn't going to do this today, but why not? Why not? Why not, man? <laughs> Hyboria. And look how we belly flop on punt, right? P U N T. I can't make this up. Gold Hills, right? We talk about golden cities like Ophir. Timbuktu, Kush. So when they're talking Kush, Monaga, they're not talking Africa. <laughs> Oh, it's just a gamer map with all the drop, with all the drop. We're talking Hyborian War. So your Africa will be around here. <laughs> Atlantis somewhere in the middle, you know, but Iranistan is here, which would be Persia. So when you're hearing this Iran flow, Iran, it's still connected with the Thothamon spell barrier in South America, back to the Amazon, right? Black kingdoms, and above it is Kush, with the capital, same capital, Moro, right? Timbuktu or Timbuktu, boom. Then you got Punt, Zimbabwe, Iran, all this is connected here, my Nostalgia is Egypt, which has Luxor, Kim, right? Okay, haunted pyramids. And the city of Ophir is above this. This is Shem, S H E M. And above it is Ophir, O P H I R, Ophir. And then right around the Cali side, you got this pick land, which <laughs> I've been promising Aqua Tire five, six, six, seven years we're going to start digging on. Or just do a whole series on the picks because we know these are Hebrews and it's connected right here. And these picks, you know, are the predecessors of all the roots and everybody. So, look, man, you got 12 tribes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, man. Okay, picked it, C, cushioned C, and of course, punt, right? P U N T. Can't make this stuff up.
So the Grand Canyon got a connection with these Phoenician Israelites. Of course, Egypt, the OG, because it's all happening here. This is the old world. This is Atlantis. This is Egypt. It's all happening, right? The whole area was destroyed and sunk into the sea at a latter date, along with much at the, as this land of Mu, Sheba, or Punt, right? All connected. This great river was in ancient times known as the Eridanus River or Red River. Or are we talking the Red Sea? Indian Ocean was called the Eridanus or the Erythrian Sea. The Eridanus River, also known as the Sickness or Swan. Hebrew word of the day, Babar. Babar in Hebrew means swan. Barbary, barbarian, all swan. Now we can bring in the swan knights like we did before, connected with Sylvanus to Texas and Kalelus. Go get that drop. Because these were knights they found in America. This is an empire they found in America. We just let them know. That's why we don't let them tell us that we're from Africa. We don't let them tell us that we're from any particular place that they want to put us in because we know we in the old world right here boss because the grand canyon was originally settled right here at home man by israel and now these seas are bringing out the swan flow there's an ancient greek myth that tells of Phaeton, the son of helios listen up because you got helios sun god right Zeus, right? Falling into the Eridanus River and his friend Cygnus mourning for him and being turned into a swan. Come on, man. Eridanus constellation is also associated with his Babylonian name of Star of Eridu. Some observers have even claimed to identify wall like structures and a pyramid shaped object in the Perth or Swan Canyon. We got to dig on everything named Swan, man. It's getting a little more. The great city of Sheba may have been at the ancient mouth of the Fitzroy River, many miles into the present ocean. At one time, there was a merchant's trade route that went directly southeast from Sheba to Ophir. Trade route, kind of like a Silk Road, like a Genghis Khan Silk Road. There was a settlement at Mount Newman, and even in the early days of the British settlement, there was a belief that the white tribe <laughs> died, died. When they say white, I'm going to say righteous, because white means pure, right? <laughs> that this pure tribe of aboriginals lived in the area, and a number of sightings of pure aboriginals were reported. Notice they got to make everything white, knowing damn well these people we're not some un non melanated people way back when in the old world to in Egypt, <laughs> in Israel, in America. Stop the hijack. This is what they do to write themselves in. Either they put their images or they sprinkle their their color in, right? So called. Going further southeast was another settlement near Walga Rock near Q. Mm, then you got the Heber, Heber flow, the Kavera flow. Picking up right here, the Lake Austin settlement may have been part of the ancient inland kingdom of Heber. And what, did, what did we get before about this Heber, right? This Kavera, right? Its major center being Lake Mackay. Fuck, <coughs> so or Lake Austin site may have been a settlement in the land of Ophir. In the far northeast portion, southwest from Ophir was the city of Kadar near Gracetown, Margaret River area of Western Australia. So, you're seeing a lot of secret drop right here. You're getting the Australia's Antarctica connection with the Israelite connection in real time. You're getting the Eber 
and the anion flow. <laughs> We're going to talk Anon, Anion, and uh, Anon Ben David, Daniel, Book of Daniel, Daniel Kumisi, Jacob Kirkasani, connect that with the Sauceland flow. Uh, I mean, let's go. This is <laughs> Press the 130. Because we want some more. Let's go. So Hebrew, what does that remind you of again? What does that remind you of? Because we're really catching the hijack slipping left and right. Because they're going to try to act like these are white tribes, right? <laughs> White Aborigines, white originals, because Aborigines just means original first. So white first, that's an anacronym. <laughs> that's an oxymoron. <laughs> Tall, fair skin, they always do that, right? With a yellow tinge rather than black or copper. <laughs> Uh-oh, I think we got them, boss. I think we got them. What does copper have to do with the kingdom of Eber? What's it got to do with the copper? Back to the Hindu. <laughs> Back to HVK.org. What's it got to do with the copper color car? About 5,000 BC or earlier, a brilliant deified Phoenician, back to Phoenicia, Naga, King, and philosopher named Kuvera, or Kuvera, sounds like Cuba, learned how to smelt copper, gold, and other metals. These activities took place in the kingdom named after him, Kyber. See how they put the K on it? They also put a Q sometimes. Kiveri. Which consists of a group of craggy mountains in what are now southeastern Afghanistan. Remember we got who Afghan was. Get the last drop. That's the grandson of King Saul. King Saul, he's a Benjamite. So when you talk Afghan, you're talking the tribe of Benjamin. He's the son of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's son is Afghan. Benjamin. They all came up in the court of King David, my lady. So we're talking Davidic still. And the northern Pakistan, Khyber Pass. According to Hindu mythology, Kuvera and the god Shiva. Well, we just got that. But Shiva is what? Sheba, right? <laughs> So you're talking about Queen Khalifa, you're talking about Queen Sheba, lived in a total barren, mineral poor, goldless, frigid, lofty, bell-shaped, pyramidal peak of the Kalasa, of the Kalasa in western Tibet. Edward Pocock stated in his book, India and Greece, the Khyber, its region is wealthy and abounds with rubies. So, I dodged the Hindu mythology with their Shivas, and I dodged this mineral poor situation because we know that their region is wealthy <laughs> and abounds with rubies. Gold is found in the mines in this vicinity. And in Quivera Kingdom, Quivera Kingdom was likewise the ruling power in those days. So, when we talk Quivera, we're talking Eber, Heber. Or Hebrew. We're talking copper. <laughs> got him. Glad we got all these substantiating recons, man. <laughs> what else will we have after 133 full <laughs> investigations? 
And now we're on 134. We got we got pounds on pounds of that work, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we derived our word copper from Kuveta's name. And Kuveta, again, is this Naga king, right? Phoenician Naga king. Kuveta. Kivera. So copper comes from the name Kivera. Or Heber. <laughs> Eventually the Nagas extended their influence all over India. Superior. Dodge to hijack. If you intuited that Afghan, remember Benjamin, Kyber, Kiver <laughs> he is Hebrew. Heber, my naga, pronounced Kiver. Uh oh, wait a minute. Heber? Heber is copper, and copper is Eber. And Eber. Our ancestor Eber is where they're getting the Eberu or Eberu, right, right, right. But they're saying they're white. It's the white tribe, right? They're saying it's the white tribe. And that they're more yellow <laughs> than black. Or copper. Hmm. Remember, fair don't fair just means beautiful. It's not even meaning light. But they're trying to make it white, which just means pure. So I just call it the righteous tribe of originals that have beautiful copper skin. Cause <laughs> the copper is the Hebrew. Ka The kingdom of Heber is the kingdom of Heber, of the Hebrew, is the kingdom of Kiver, is the copper. Managa. So you don't got no white aboriginals. We still talking copper Nagas because Eber is copper. Managa. <laughs> In Egyptian, it is Kipri. Kipri in a dick. In Egyptian is copper. Kipri, in, <laughs> Kipri is the Hebrew by Naga. So now if you're digging on the codexes or, you know, ancient documents of Egypt and you come across the Kipri, you can now connect it with Hebrew or the Hebrew or the Kafera. <laughs> Kabera. Kyprak or Kypriak Kipri. Biblical Capernaum. Hmm. <laughs> Colin Capernaum. <laughs> All right, man. Shout out to the bro, man. Um so <laughs> this also connects with the Kabar. And the Bible Kaveri. Now look how they're spelling Kaveri now, right? They put a Q on it, boss. And this is what you see it on the maps, boss. And uh, this is what you're seeing on the maps, boss. Corvera, the U's, V's, this is a V. All right, the Corvera, Corvera kingdom. The kingdom of Eber is right in America. And you got dragons in the water, unicorn dragons. <laughs> Corvera, right? We're going to talk Antioch, like we've been talking or not. Right? But Corvera is right there in your face.
Quivera in America, my nigga. Under Anion, my nigga. Anion Red, Anion Regnum Kingdom, right? Quivera Kingdom, man. The Quivera Kingdom is the kingdom of the Hebrews. The copper color cons found here by the Europeans, 1828 definition of America. India Superior is the kingdom of the Hebrews, man. <laughs> Body bag is Quivera. They call him the fabled Quivera. You see how they spell it with a K? Or a Q. And now it's fabled, right? Here we go again. Just like uh, <laughs> Australia. This is now some mythological, hypothetical thing, right? Now it's fabled, Caver. Land of Eber, the Hebrews. In America, and he, uh, right in our face, right in America, my nigga. <laughs> I just get excited because it's so obvious after all this time. And Tangu, according to President John Lydia and his sources, is also spelled T E N D U C. Tandu. Now we got the Tangu over there, kind of Canada ish, right? But then this one here is. Across Antioch, which makes another hard hit for a possibility of where they had to go see the Prester. He would kind of be right next to Antioch, right? Anon Ben David. So is he over there or is he over here? And what's up with this Quivera? And how many maps show us Quivera, America? David Ramsey, still in the 1500s. All right. Man, look at that belly flop. Right in it, right in it, right in it, man. <laughs> and this one, you don't get one Corvetta, you get two Corvettas. Say it with me Corvetta, Corvetta. <laughs> and see now the U's or whatever look like V's, right? And the other one, the V's look like U's. So you just got to dodge all hijacks to see clearly. Right now, the V's look like U's. <laughs> The other ones look like Q V I V. This one like Q U I U, but we got the same Corvette. Ragna under Ania. So the fabled Quivera, <laughs> Q-U-I-V, so sometimes, like I say, look like U-U or V-V, but it's U-I-V. Quivera is Kibera, is Hebrew <laughs> in America. Let's go. We're going to talk some Ania. We're going to talk some Ania. To talk Ania, man, we're going to have to. I'm going to do it.
do it like this. We're going to belly flop. So we have Anam and David, right? Persian too. Remember that Persian flow? <laughs> Iran is dead right here in America, right? Founder of the Ananias anti rabbinical order from which the still existing Kari religious movement developed, right? We got this before. So what was the beef between Anand and his brothers, right? They bring up a couple different uh, brothers that were battling for this title. This office of Exilarch, the head of the Hebrews of the Babylonian exile. That's so what it's got to do with David Sauslin of Babylon and Georgia and then, right? So pay attention to how this connects with the Sauslin flow, man. It's about to be mind blowing, man. Mind blasting. So this Anion flow, this Quivera flow, seems to really fit in with this Anon Ben David story. David being the son, or excuse me, uh, Daniel being the son of David, had an issue with the Nah. Yeah, he had some beef with the Nah. Daniel Al Kum, right? Kum means to what? To rise with a Q or a K. So Daniel was on the rise. He's, he's the perfection of his father. So we're saying, you know, in this investigation, at least we're saying there's a possibility or is there a possibility, you know, that this is the same Daniel, it's all the same Daniel. Book of Daniel, this is the same Daniel from the book of Daniel, right? They don't know when this thing is written. And look at this question mark. They don't even know exactly when he lived, right? <laughs> It's a question mark. They think he died in 946. But he got an issue with Anand. So if Anand's popping off in the 700s, they said, he's popping off in the 900s. <laughs> so there's this 200-year gap, right? But let's go. Dodge the timelines. We're going to get it. Daniel L. Kuhn was one of the most prominent early scholars of the Karia Judaism or the Karakatai Judah. Dodge the isms and the issues. So let's get it. He flourished at the end of the 9th or the beginning of the 10th century. He was a native Damaga, capital of the city of Kumis, in the former state of Tabaristan or Iran, right? <laughs> That's why I had this Hyboria map up, because I, I knew Iran was going to keep coming up, man. Hyboria. I mean, honestly, <laughs> why is Iran instead here connected to the tip of, you know, South America, you know what I mean? Brazil, all that, right? Jungle Kingdom. <laughs> Thoth Amon Spellbear. And what's this got to do with? To who they in there? Thought in them, right? Okay. Because there's a spell barrier when it comes to this Iran flow. Interesting. Iran, Iran. Now, as is shown by its two surnames, the latter of which is found only in Jacob Kirkasani's works. And this is when it gets real interesting. But let's keep reading. Al Kumisi's attitude to a non Ben David or Ania. And I keep saying, wouldn't the Prester, would his son have a whole kingdom, have a whole, you know what I mean? When it, when it comes to Azalar, it's about territory, you know what I'm saying? So his violent opposition to the Ananites, so now it became some violent op opposition, but it wasn't always that way when it comes to David's. Bond, David's children. Now we know in the in the Torah, uh, in the Tanakh, uh, David has uh, some issue, right? They, they said he killed the man. We're gonna briefly touch on that for the dismount, <laughs> Queen Tamar and Yuri and all that. Now they say he took someone out this dot week. We're saying 
David is innocent. Now, it didn't always start as some violent opposition, you know what I'm saying? At, at first, David's bonds, they all get, you know, it's all good. But just like in the Tanakh, the kingdom is divided after this whole Bathsheba situation, right? After he so-called kills a man, and then he has to be in exile from his people, and then the kingdom is divided, and now he has to fight against his own son, and his own son gets slain. Absalom, right? Okay. Okay, let's go. So I'm saying, is it a possibility that we see it being played out very similar where David's children are going through this type of opposition now? Is it because he slayed a man or is it because of the circumstances? Is this Daniel of the book of Daniel? <laughs> right? Is this Kiliab? Is this Kiliab, also known as Daniel? Right? Is Daniel Kum the Daniel, right? Who's also called Kiliab, second son of David, king of Israel, according to the Bible. David's Son with his third wife Abigail, widow of Nabal the Carmelite, mentioned in First Chronicles three one, and Second Samuel three three. Unlike the other of David's three elder sons, Amnon, <laughs> or Arna, <laughs> or Ania, my <Managi. laughs> Absalom and Adonijah, who were important characters in 2 Samuel, Kiliab is only named in the list of David's sons, and no further mention is made of him, though being the second son. Kiliab was not a contender for the throne of Israel. Even after the death of the firstborn Amnon, the thirdborn Absalom and fourthborn Adonijah, he may have died before his father. So why wouldn't Daniel be a contender for the throne of Israel, right? And why don't you hear that Daniel is the son of David ever in your Christian church or anywhere? Right? <laughs> what are they hiding about this Daniel? He's in the house of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, right? He, he gets kidnapped, <laughs> you know, uh, held hostage, the Persian, you know, Babylonian situation. So Nebuchadnezzar literally means Nebo, defend my boundaries, defend your boundaries. Nebo connects with Moab in there. What has it got to do with Moab and him? It has everything to do with Moab and him if it has everything to do with Genghis Khan? who pressed the child legend in his sources, according to Keegan Brewer. One of the letters says he's from a tribe called Moal, M-O-A-L. One letter rule, or his brother. <laughs> Back to the Moab. Or the Confederacy. But he's kidnapped. He's held hostage. Now, Nebuchadnezzar in the story, he raises up Daniel, right, <laughs> to to kind of like be the Khan. You know what I'm saying? He, he has the charge of the kingdom, in a sense. He's able to decipher dreams and do all kind of things, right? So he's very special. Same way they say in Daniel Kloom is super duper special and amazing, scholarly and all this stuff, right? Daniel was raised to be Exilarch, but he's raised by Nebuchadnezzar. Or let's, you know, just for the investigation purpose, <laughs> we in the fifth way, let's just call it Genghis Khan, right? Because these are all titles. Genghis Khan raises up Daniel, Preston John's bar, and he respects him because he's Preston's son. Not only Preston's son, but he resembles David. His name Kili, it means perfection of the father. And Hawa arranged it that way because they didn't know if Daniel was the son of uh, Nabal or David because Abigail was a widow at the time. So she had a previous husband and they didn't know for sure if Daniel 
was David's son. They had to know for sure. So Hawa arranged that Kiliab would resemble David, and thus the name Kiliab, meaning perfection of his father David. A reference to or cause of that legend. So if you have a perfection of David living with you, <laughs> you might want to spare that man <laughs> and, you know, raise him up right. So Daniel raises up, um, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar or Genghis Khan raises up Daniel. He becomes Axelar because the king makes him Axelar. But that's, that don't fit too well with the tribe on the outside because they want to raise up their own Axelar, right? It's like the streets want their own king. You can't give us a king. Now, if you hijack us and say, I'm going to choose a king for you, we're going to have an issue with that. If the president of the United States say, I'm going to choose a king of the so-called black people, we're not going to really respect that naga because he was chosen by President Trump, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, but we don't have all the knowledge or the wisdom. Hawa arranged it, right? Hawa arranged him to be perfect because Daniel is one of the four Israelites who died without any sin. Not Jesus. <laughs> Jesse, you switch to S and the E at the end, and you got Jesus. Jesse's a perfect man, and he is the father of David. And then David's son is also a perfect nugget. But David's not a perfect nugget because he killed a man. So called, killed a man to steal his woman, Bathsheba. Really? Y'all buying that? Or was Yuri or Uriah really trying to hijack the kingdom like it like it rocks according to the real story of the Queen Tamar? Queen Tamar was supposed to, or she fell in love with David, right? Queen Tamar is Sheba, Bathsheba, which is the title, House of Sheba, daughter of the seven, daughter of the oath, seven cities of gold. She falls in love with David, same way, but this is happening in real history, right? <laughs> You know, so-called real history, right? So, um, but she was arranged to marry this other prince named Yuri. It sounds like Uriah in the in the story, right? <laughs> um, you know, in the Tanakh. So, Uriah, this mighty man of David, is Prince Yuri, who was arranged to be married to Queen Tamar or Sheba, but she didn't really want to be with him, and he tried to hijack her and take over the kingdom because he didn't want to be under her because at this time, Sheba was running the Khan. She had the Khan. <laughs> Sheba at this time had the Khan. Queen Tamar at this time had the Khan. And David Sauceless was king consort. Queen Tamar was his mama, you know, queen of Georgia, Georgia on my mind, father, and David Sauston, the father of George IV, king of Georgia. So this is the original George title, not the hijacked George, but the OG George title. Kingdom, Georgia, Rusadan, Queen of Georgia. Lady Hannah, all this connects with the Rusadans because David's mom is Princess Rusadan of Georgia, which is Lady Hannah. Son of Jadaron, King of the Islands, which is Jadaron, Raja, Raja, Chola, <laughs> Preston John. Husband of Lady Hannah now. Or Rusadash, right? So let's talk about this King Consort. It doesn't mean that. 
this was some matriarchy. It just means that this is a time of war <laughs> and our aquas knew how to keep the water flowing, man, and keep the kingdom tight. You know what I'm saying? If we go to war right now, you know what I'm saying? And all the ox is like, all right, we're on the front line. We're about to fight these hijacks. We ain't going to put our women on the front line. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Who's going to raise our children, right? So our women had to, you know, hold hold down the house. You know, Nagas went on the front line. At the same time, we know we have high Amazon queens that also were on the front line. So we had ox and aquas on the front line, no doubt. You know what I'm saying? Um, in this particular house at this time, <laughs> Queen Tamar had the con, man. Now, if you look at it, you know, from another perspective, right? XLR David Sauceland. Here we go again. This time it doesn't say King Consort, so it leaves that part out, but it does say he's the son of Raja Hiraja Chola Prester Child. So he's the son of the Khan. <laughs> Clearly he has the Khan. And from one perspective, you say, okay, well, this time period, you know what I mean? Um, you know, he's under or rocking side by side with Lady Hannah or Queen Tamar, however you want to see it, but we know that we was rocking together. You know what I mean? It wasn't no patriarchy or matriarchy. It was frame or shaper, frame or shape, rocking together. And this is what this is signifying when you're seeing it this way, King Consort. So Killian, Daniel, son of David, also known as Daluya or Dalawa. Die without sin, of course, along with Benjamin, where the Afghans are coming out of Afghanistan, <laughs> Jesse and Amram, or Rambam, if we're talking Moses, Mama need it. Let's go. And I'll drop these links, you know, it's a lot, but you can get what you got to get out of it. Here it says Anon means cloud, my nigga. Remember we did that cloud drag and drop? <laughs> and what's a cloud? You know what I'm saying? So this can easily be a dragon reference right here, man. Was never a very common name among the Jews, but it is attested in the Bible. What? The original Anon was one of the Israelites who sealed the covenant. Hmm? After the return from the Babylonian captivity in Nehemiah 10? So is this the original Anon or is this the same Anon? But we're now seeing the real timeline. And they try to act like it's a different Anon when they just told you it's not a very common name. So it's a hard hit when we talk Nehemiah 10, 26. We're just listing all these chiefs that were pressed, including Hosea or Joshua. <laughs> Hana, right? Remember, they can spell it with the Hana with an H, or they can take the H off and you got Anna, but no doubt. Here goes Hana again and Anna. Okay, <laughs> I ain't seen that one yet. And the thing with the Anon as well is it can also be Kanan. You could put a C in front. We're still talking Persia, Babylon. 
sons of Shaphat ben Yahanan, which is John, my nigga. So John is Yahanan, which is Anan or Hanan. <laughs> And he's the father of Abraham, Ha Davi, David. Nathan and Nathan ben Cana, <laughs> which is Ania, which is Sana, because we're still talking Axelarks, man. Yeah. Let's get it. Founder of the Carriots, huh? Founder of the Karkata. In the second half of the 7th century and in, in the whole of the 8th, as a result of the tremendous intellectual commotion produced throughout the Orient by the swift conquest of the Arabs and the collision of victorious Islam with the uh, older religions and cultures of the world, there arose a large number of religious sects, especially in Persia, Babylonian, Syria, Judah did not escape this general fermentation. The weak remnants of the early schisms, the Sadducees and Essenes picked up new life and flickered once more before their final extinction. All the various heresies would nevertheless have quickly disappeared or been assimilated by rabbinical Judaism if the political conditions of the Jews in the Eastern Caliphate had not pushed to the front a certain energetic and determined man, placed him at the head of the new movement. So great was his influence that he succeeded in uniting all heterogeneous, heterogeneous, anti-rabbinical elements to be anti-rabbinical is to be anti their hijack uh you know fake rabbis you know what i'm saying he's anti their isms he's anti their issues he's not anti the real rabbis he's anti their you know rabbinical you know uh, judaisms you know issues he's anti all this swerving that they're doing, you know what I'm saying? So in forming a powerful sect of them, this man, Anand bin David, had been a candidate for the highest dignity existing among the Hebrews at the time, the Exilar. It's the highest dignity, my naga. Now let's hear about his brother. Because we said, you know, is Daniel his brother? But he also has his brother, Josiah or Hosea? <laughs> Hassan? It appears that the two brothers among his nearest kin, probably nephews of his, Anon and Josiah, were next in order of succession to the exalted office. The former was older and richer in theological knowledge than the latter and was thus the better fitted for the position of prince of the exile. So while you're in captivity, who's going to be the Khan? That's what they say. And again, Nebuchadnezzar raised up Daniel to be the Khan, but Anon is coming from the streets, man. <laughs> He's like, I'm anti all these hijacks and I'm anti your king making you the con and you know now we got beef <laughs> nevertheless the nomination was given to the latter so Josiah was elected exilarch by the rectors of the Babylonian colleges whoa now who are these people it seems like again just like with Daniel the hijack the Babylonian colleges are electing our leaders right and that's not going to go well with the streets <laughs> and by the notable notables of the chief Jewish congregations and the choice was confirmed by the caliph which is Nebuchadnezzar right which is 
the gang is kind, right? So you know, they try to, you know, throw their stones at Anon now. Oh, he, he showed evidence of lukewarmness towards traditional Judaism. Ism, right? He's anti rabbinical He's not with your isms. <laughs> and I wasn't playing this stuff. Josiah played the game. Or Hosea. <laughs> Amounting even to disdain. While Josiah was pious and reverent uh, conformity to the law. Any or whose law? We're talking Babylonian law. You know what I mean? Any disregard for rabbinical Judaism on Anand's part may be accounted for by his long sojourn east of Baghdad and the Persian Mesopotamian borders, which were then the chief hotbeds of anti-rabbinical schisms. However that may be, it is certain that Anand's proud disposition would by no means permit him to submit tamely to his defeat and place himself in subordination to his younger brother. His political partisans, who seemed to follow him in religious matters also, did not desert him. And so it came to pass that Adam permitted himself to be proclaimed anti exilarch Or in other words, anti their exilarch anti your hijack exilarch I'm anti whatever y'all standing on. That's straight up rebellion now, right? So this step was naturally construed by the Mohammedan authorities. Whoa. <clears throat> so, of course, we're talking Baghdad, right? And again, if we're talking Nebuchadnezzar, we're talking this Mohammedan connection or this, uh, you know, Islam connection or, you know, this Moabite connection, however you want to break it down tribally. But this is who got Daniel in captivity. <laughs> the Mohammedans, Moab in there, Genghis in there, man. So it was construed by Moab in there as rebellion against the authority. He was rebelling against the authority of the caliph, they said who had formerly invested Josiah with the position. And such as act, an act on the part of Demi, or follower of religion tolerated by Islam, that is a Jew or Christian, must in the Mohammedan state appear serious in the extreme. Yeah. You can't be rocking your own thing. You, you got to be serious about your conversion <laughs> to Islam. Or you got to get down, get down and lay down with that. So therefore, Anon proclaimed himself Exilar. <laughs> and he was arrested by the authorities one Sunday in the year 767 and thrown into prison to be executed on the ensuing Friday as guilty of high treason, but luckily for Anand, he met in jail a very prominent and shrewd fellow prisoner, no other than the founder of the great Mohammedan Kasuistic school of Hanifites, on the name of Al Numan Tabat Tabit, surname Abu Hanifa. He gave the unhappy pretender to the exilar the following very shrewd advice which saved his life. The pretender should set himself to expound all ambiguous and doubtful precepts of the Torah in a fashion exactly opposed to the tradition interpreted interpretation and make this principle the foundation of the new religious sect. He must next get his partisans to secure by means of present and presence and bribes to the highest officers of the court, the presence of the caliph himself at the trial his presence not being an unusual thing at the more important prosecutions. <laughs> Dang. Back it up, man. You dropping too fast. So here's, you know, just a brief bit of what this schism is popping off with.
So by the time we get to Daniel, you know, you heard about the Anon and his brother Josiah flow, but again, they're leaving out this Daniel connection. So we're going to get on Jacob Kirkasani's work because that's who is validating this surname Kumisi on Daniel. Al Kumisi or L, right? You know, we're talking strong power. We're talking Aleph, <laughs> like the uh, great American eclipse making an Aleph, right? Oh, don't they call Hawa El Hawa as well? All Kumisi's attitude to Anan ben David and his violent opposition to the Ananites, first Karius, and his followers and immediate successors are characteristic of his place of Karius. At first, he esteemed Anan highly, calling him Rosh Hamaskilim, chief of the scholars. However, he later despised him and called him Rosh HaKasalim, chief of the fools. Whoa! Hey, ain't this April Fool's Day, man? <laughs> I can't make this stuff up, man. Chief of the fools, man. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> All right. So, first Daniel esteemed Anon highly. He said, hey, man, he's chief of the scholars. And then later, Daniel called him chief of the fools. Nevertheless, Daniel's opinions were respected by the Karians, because, hey, Daniel's been lifted to this high seat by Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's still a perfect Naga. You know, it's not like he's, you know what I'm saying, some hijack, doing hijack things. He's he's a perfect Naga. He's still Daniel, man. Daniel is still Daniel. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> One of the four ancient Israelites who died without Saying he's still the perfection of his father. He's still the son of Dawi, king of Israel. So he's probably, you know, calling a non chief of the fools because he is calling himself anti exile. <laughs> And named himself Exilar and yada yada, right? So, nevertheless, Daniel's opinions were respected by the Karites. And we said Daniel later immigrated to Jerusalem and founded the Order of the Mourners of Zion. And they were basically mourning the temple, you know, mourning the destruction of the temple. He may have built the oldest Karait synagogue, which is located in Jerusalem, espous espousing proto Zionist views. Uh, he urged his fellow Karians to return to Israel and called those who opposed doing so fools who draw the Lord's wrath in his epistle to the diaspora. So, you know, this Daniel had a lot of drop. As regards... Daniel's theories, he denied the speculation. That speculation could be regarded as a source of knowledge <laughs> and probably followed his tenet, he maintained. In opposition to Anan, the principle that the biblical laws must not be interpreted allegorically nor explained contrary to the simple text. Hmm. No allegories, just keep it trill is what he's saying. Interesting. I, mean, I kind of rock with a lot of what both Anon and Daniel are kicking, but let's keep going. He evinces little regard for science. Okay. <laughs> for instance, he asserted, it is forbidden to determine the new moon by calculation after the manner of the Rabbinites because such calculations are condemned like astrology. This practice is threatened with severe punishment in Isaiah 47, 13 through 14. Nonetheless, Daniel in his commentary to Leviticus 26 indulges in long reflections on the 
the odyssey and the suffering of the pious, his conception of the angels also is most extraordinary. Uh oh, what's he got to say about these dragons? He says that wherever Malachim or angels are mentioned in the Bible, the designation does not revere to living, speaking beings who act as messengers, but to forces of nature. Fire, fall, wind. Sounds like that, Dracon. <laughs> Because with the dragon flow, you're just talking about the elements, fire, water, ether, earth. A dragon can take on any um, likeness, right? That's why we're not supposed to just have some likeness of the creator when the creator could be any signature of energy, frequency, and vibration. A dragon is not just some reptile. We're just talking about the elements, especially if you're talking seraphim, I know it. Highest order of the angels. We're talking fire when we talk seraphim. Fiery, right? Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't burnt by some men with wings, but by that fire, right? So, through which Hawa performs his works. But this may be due to the influence of the Sadducees, Sadducees who also denied the existence of angels compared to acts of apostles right? and in works circulated among the earlier carrier named after Zadok or Melchizedek and containing Sadducee opinions. I mean, I'm just bringing you into the schism. They pretty much had a code issue, but they were very specific and particular <laughs> about their code. Very particular about the code. Now, what did it say at the top? That this surname of Kumis, right? It said the latter of which is found only in Jacob Kirkusini's work. Now we got to dig on Kirkusini, man. Before we do that, remember this one here as well. David Ben Moshe Al Kumis. Now, instead of spelling the coon with a K, they spell it with a Q. Just like Covera and Kieber, right? <laughs> Here, let's go. Daniel Ben Moses. Now, we say it's David Moses, my nigga, because we keep coming to the same crux, right? <laughs> God. Carry it, scholar, our right, leader, Avile, mourners of Zion, mourning Dom, Gone, promise of Kumis, Persia. Same thing we just got. Daniel even belittled the fellow or founder of Karism, Anam and David, and dissented from certain of his halakhic or, you know, uh, his law, righteous you know, principles, justifying himself. By the maxim, those who came later will find the truth. Daniel also constantly maintained his principle, this principle in regard to himself. According to the Karyat scholar, Kirk Asani, he would accept any conclusion arriving at by reasoning and would acknowledge changes whenever they occur in regard to opinions he had expressed in his writings. In matters of law, Daniel was more rigorous than his fellow Karyats. On the other hand, he is said to have exempted males under the age of 20 from the duty to observe all the biblical ordinances and admitted the testimony of Muslims in matters connected with the determination of the Jewish calendar. So all these were scholars, all these were writers and you know, if some Muslims had to drop on the calendar, he admitted the testimony. <laughs> um, but maybe Anand didn't like that, you know. And again, he interprets, for instance, the concept of angels as natural forces, such as fire and water, my naga. <laughs> Keep that fire burning. Keep that water flowing. Sent as divine emissaries and consequently negates the existence of angels or men with wings but these dragons are fire these dragons are water 
I like I like these knock. I like this knock, man. His most complete exit extant work, Petran Shanae Asar, a commentary on the minor prophets, contains bitter criticism of the rabbinate and the de degeneration of Jewish people throughout pursuit of worldly occupations and pleasures. Daniel blamed the prolongation of the exile on the neglect of the divine truth. In other words, Nagas was neglecting the code, i.e. the Bible, due to the negative influence of the rabbinic shepherds. Sounds like Ezekiel 37 with these shepherds. You know what I mean? That, hey, we need a correction, right? We needed one shepherd. You know, scriptures talk about the wicked shepherds, right? So we ex we especially condemn the air he especially condemned the arrogance of the rabbis and their officials. And their economic exploitation of their people. I like this knot. According to Daniel, the Torah was at first in the possession of a restricted group, the priest and Levite. Together with the king, however, after the destruction of the first temple, it was handed over to the entire Hebrew people in order that each individual should bear responsibility for his actions. Ain't no other naga going to save you. You got to keep the code and bear responsibility for your own actions. I like this naga. And then we got... You know, the mourners of Zion, you know, because they were mourning the temple that was destroyed. Jacob Kirk is signing, since he's the one that, you know, signed off <laughs> on this Kumis, Kumisi name. Who's, who's Jacob? <laughs> is this the Jacob? I don't know, man. <laughs> well, let's go. Because it's all happening for sure. They also call him Yosef. Interesting. <laughs> Yosef. Ben Isaac. Yaakov Ben Isaac. Ha Korkisani. Now, this is getting too familiar, right? Because, <laughs> you know, don't we have um, I mean, you know They would all be sons of Isaac, Abraham, right? <laughs> God, God And then you got Jacob and Esau, sons of Isaac It's just It's history repeating itself, my naga Or are we lost in the timelines with this genealogy? Now it says, carry dogmatist exegete who flourished in the first half of the 10th century. His origins are unknown. So you can't tell us who we are. How can you tell us who we're not? You don't even know anything about this Jacob. So you can't tell us he's not the Jacob. He's the son of Isaac. <laughs> His patronym, Isaac, and Technanim Joseph reflect no more than the genealogy of biblical patriarchs. So they're trying to say, oh, they just reflect no more than the fact that maybe they're related to these patriarchs or <laughs> these are the patriarchs. That's another option. Now, while his surname was being taken as referring to either ancient Kur Kassim. Remember this Kur Kassim because it just reminds me of some other investigation we did into this David Sauslin flow. We're about to get it. Huh. His surname has been taken as referring to the ancient Kur Kassim or Kur, Kur Kassim. Eastern Syria, Karkasan near Baghdad, though no carrier community is known in either place, but they just said his origins, boss, are unknown. 
So these are their, this is their guesswork at this point. <laughs> this is their conjecture at this point, man. Con. <laughs> It's getting too good. This, what's this carcass Sam about? Carcass Sam, known in Arabic as Al Carcassia. And remember with the Arabic flow, managas, you're talking Arab, proper and Arab. Pretender and an Arab is a rabbi. A true rabbi is a, a rabbi. Arab, proper. These are Hebrews under Joktan Managa. Go recon Joktan. It's going to connect you with the Arab propers in the Jewish Encyclopedia Managa, right? So we're still talking Hebrews when you see Arabic. The first Naga to speak Arabic was a Hebrew Managa, the son of Joktan. They said was the first to speak. A rabbi, Arabic, Arab proper. Roman fortress city near the junction of the Euphrates. Whoa. <laughs> Don't we have a Euphrates in America, boss? <laughs> Ain't the Romans Romani, boss? Kabar, 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 Habar, Heber. Located at the empire's eastern frontier with the Sasanian Empire. Procopius calls it the farthest fortress of the Romani. So this Jacob Kirkusini flow connects with the farthest fortress <laughs> of the Romani. Romani in Hebrew means pomegranates, which leads you to the promised land that, uh, you know, Joshua and Caleb had to get the pomegranates to prove they're in the promised land. Right. Let's go. Let's put this puzzle together in real time. I was doing this in real time. So it was later conquered by the Muslim Arabs. Could have just said the Arabs, but they had to say the Muslim Arabs. So you know which Arabs we talking about? The Arab pretenders, like Ishmael, right? Like Moab and them. <laughs> in the seventh century, and was often a point of contention between various Muslim states due to its strategic location between Syria and Iraq. Farthest fortress. Now, this just reminds me of this uh, David Sawson flow. Just right quick, right quick. Remember, the Sawson connects you with the Ossetians. And remember, we got on the Ossetians and the connection with the Ossetians and the Amazons, right? The Alanias, right? Who is the king of the islands, Managa, right? David Soslin's father, right? <laughs> is the king of the islands, right? Jadaran is the king of the islands. Ka Jadaran, Presta John is the king of the islands. Ka. Prester John is the king of Alania. Huh? We, we, we bring it into the house of Georgia like I said we would. Because <laughs> we ran right into the Georgian Ossetia conflict. Led to the popular rise of Alania. Uh, medieval kingdom of the Iranian islands. Where's where's Iranistan again, man? That's why I got this map up. Every time I see it, I R A N I S T A N Iranistan seems to be connected on this side of things. You know what I mean? 
You know what I'm saying? Okay. We're talking to Lania. The name of the medieval Sarmatian confederation to which the Assetians traced their origin and to the inclusion of this name into the official Republican title of North Assetia 1994. So all that was hijacked. That's way too late. <laughs> Been hijacked before that. But this relation with the Sarmatians, it was the same as the Amazon. Herodotus claims that this Saramata predecessors of the Sarmatians who ruled the lands between the Caspian Sea and Black Sea arose from the union of the Scythians and the Amazons. Product of the Scythian Sarmatian lifestyle. So these Amazons united with the Scythians or the Scots, Scotland, Scythians, and these Scythians are the same connected with the princess Scotia. Of Egypt? <laughs> are we still just talking the Egypt, Iberian, Greek, Hebrews, right? We're still talking Queen Tamar. Because Tamar is the wife of David Sosna. Bagratina, now we're talking Bagratoni Dynasty, right? House of Georgia. Tamar the Great. And she was Khan at a time. She had to hold the Khan up. And then she, you know, finally married her, her, uh, you know, her love thing, her love thing, David Sausland, right? And then they ruled together, Khan. Now it says ex ex wife of Prince Yuri, my nigga, right? Just remember this. <laughs> and I'm saying this same Yuri in the Bible is Uriah, who they said David slayed to get his wife Sheba. And Sheba is Tamar, my nigga, all time. But the story with this Yuri was much different. He was trying to hijack the kingdom. He was trying to make a military coup pop off. He's the son of an Osetia, right? He's one of the Osetias. He's one of the Osetias, which connect back to the Amazon flow, which is why they were arranged to be married, her and Yuri. We're talking the royals. <laughs> We are talking the house of Jerusalem, King Kindred. These are house of Andreas, Kindred to the kings and queens of Jerusalem. So we're always talking Israel. We're always talking that when we talk lost tribe of Andros, right? The Andrews, right? We're always talking Israel, right? Lost tribes of Israel, right? We're always talking Israel. We always talking lost tribes. This is why we gotta search so we can find us. Now Sauslin has a name. <laughs> Back to the Osetia flow, right? So okay, <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. We're connecting Georgian Bragatoni dynasties, you know, House of Georgia, David. The Sausland, the Rus, we're connecting uh, Moses Mamadides with the Anan Ben Davids, with the 
Daniel Comises with the Jacob Kirk Hussainis, and look at how this let's just let's just see how this all plays with this Kirkasian. Because his surname has been taken as referring to ancient Kirkesia. But of course the origins are unknown. <laughs> Alright. We just belly flopping. Now it's pretty dope because I'm just looking at, you know, we've been talking David Sauston for years and then finally we actually and did a little recon, like, what, what does Sauceland mean as a title? And it says it's part of this Nart saga. And these Narts and this caucus situation, all these are Nagas. And I said, don't tell me these these people ain't even Caucasians. Because <laughs> that means they really ain't got no land nowhere. You know what I'm saying? Who was the indigenous Caucasus, Khazars, Khazarias, Mosak, remember Mo Mosak the founder, remember all that? All this plays, Byzantine, all this plays. It says Suslin, right? Sauslin, Suslin means to look menacing, my naga. And don't that sound like a dragon? <laughs> the etymology of dragon, doesn't that sound like the one with the deadly glance? The look, right? To see. Menacing. Susla, menacing, gloomy. <laughs> All right, so they're breaking it down. The variant Sasruko is in turn an adlegi or edigi borrowing from Sasru, Sauslin, and Ko, Kwa, Sun. So the origin of this name has to do with this son <laughs> of the what? The one that looks menacing? Hmm. The son of the one that looks menacing. The son of the one that looks menacing. When we talk Sauslin, the son of the one that looks menacing, right? Is Roger here, Roger Chola Presta John, <laughs> father of David Sauslin. And he's the one that looks menacing. <laughs> and I'm sure his son does too. You know what I mean? And this is why they're putting the Sauceland title. Because of this menacing look. <laughs> right? Because of this drag. The one with the deadly glances, the dragon, the one with the paralyzing sight. Paralyzing sight sounds like menacing look because it freezes you right there on the spot, right? A deadly glance sounds like a menacing look, right? <laughs> God, it's 134, man. To look menacing means you got a deadly look, deadly glance, paralyzing look, paralyzing sight. You are the dragon. I have seen to see clearly. <laughs> Do you see clearly in the year of the dragon, my night? Am I making it visible? Are we making it clear? Do you see the light? You got your dragon. Deadly glare. I can't make this stuff up, man. Allahuwa. Halawa. So to look menacing is the Susla, the menacing one, the sun. Sosru call now. All right, all right. Just, you know, digging deeper, digging deeper.
Sasriqua, Sasriqua, Sosruko, Sosla. Uh oh. <laughs> All right, man. So look at what they've done, man. Look at what they've done to King David, right? So in their mythology, just like with the Shiva Shiva connection, they're now making this person a powerful, devious man. Who is the smallest of the Narns as a character. This is what they do to us, right? <laughs> He is sometimes cast in the light as a trickster guy. What, like, like Thoth? Like Mercury? Like Hermes trigger against these three times great, man? Comparable to the Scandinavian Loki. Georgian Amarani, ancient Greek Prometheus. It is possible that at least in the latter case, Ruko deserved as a direct inspiration served Shalak as a direct inspiration. In Caucasian mythology, it was Nart Sosriqua, minion of the gods and his dotting mother, Lady Satania, <laughs> who stole fire from the giant. So who is Sultan's mother that they're calling her Satanaya, right? You already know what that sounds like, right? <laughs> Yo, they, they make all of our our people gods, some type of gods, right? They turn Sheba into Shiva, made it this dancing goddess of destruction. Now we got this dancing Sultan, right? You got a dancing Sheba, Shiva. Right. If you look up the statue of Shiva and CERN, it's like this little dancing thing. And here's this dancing sauce. So Sheba or Tamar is dancing because <laughs> she's the remember she was the queen. She was the Khan. Right. <laughs> the queen called king. And they called her the goddess of destruction to the hijack. And here's here's her man who's also depicted as a dancing car. Right. <laughs> And who's uh, David Sosland's moms again? Well, Lady Hannah, right? Or Anna, right? Because Moses' mom is named Anna, right? In the Quran. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's David Moshe. Wow. It's like a David... Moses equals Prester Magi, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you combine those and then you get the, the mythologies, you, you get all this stuff. So over here, you got David Salter's mom will be Princess Rusadeh. Is this who they're calling the Lady Satane, who stole fire from the giant, right? One folk etymology states that Sasruko is a Caucasian, from Caucasian, Sa, or sword, Managa. So not only does Saslin mean menacing looking, <laughs> Or the one with the dead, the glass, dragon. It also has to do with a sword. Wa, hit. Wa means to hit. Whoa. Just reminds me of the Hebrew wa, right? Wa means what? Foundation, security in Hebrew. <laughs> Where's my Hebrew charm, man? Let's see if we still got it up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We got some. We got some drop to drop. We got some drop to drop. 
This ain't even a dismount yet. Get cozy, man. Y'all cozy? How y'all reeling today, man? Forgot to ask y'all. How you reeling? So they're saying wa means sword, but wa also means secure, like security. <laughs> and doesn't a sword give you added security? Interesting. And they said the sa man. The sa means sword. The wa means hit, right? Okay, there we go. So the Y means hit, excuse me, or to strike, right? <laughs> so we still got security. They're saying Sa in their language was sword. You know, whether they're getting that from the scene or the sh, sh, sh. Sheen. Which became the S, right? Okay. So this could be the hard hit. And you got sharp. Whoa. Hey, I'm out of here. I'm out of here, Paul. <laughs> I'm out of here. Like sharp teeth, right? So do you see a Hebrew connection with these languages, my nagin? Do you see a Hebrew connection with these languages? How does the sword, the sa, or the sheen, where they get the S, and it's sharp, like the sword and the wild, which means to hit, and it means added security, because <laughs> you're hitting something, you're striking something, right? Now, they said the Kirkasian, the Kirkasian were, and that was what I was thinking when I saw this, this Jacob Kirkasani flow. Because it's referring to ancient Kirkesium, right? <laughs> Got a, say it with me, car, body bag. Hey, I don't, hey, look. You can search far and wide, my nigga. Ain't no one, you know, ain't, ain't no one on with you on, Drop Nation. Ain't no one connecting this wave like this, Drop Nation. Deciphering the code, halal, wa, a wa, wa. So this genealogy, biblical patriarchs, when he talks to Isaac, because Jacob is the son of Isaac. While his surname has been taken as referring, remember his origins are unknown, right? <laughs> what else has unknown origins? A dragon and alchemy, huh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Unknown substance, right? Referring to either ancient Kirkesia or Carcassonne. Kirkesia, riddle me this, has a lot to do with the Kirkesia. And the Kirkesia sword, hitting sword, has a lot to do with the sauce. And the Sauceland has a lot to do with the Exilarch, David, son of the Preston. The Sauceland has a lot to do with Lady Roos, <laughs> mother of Dawi, Sauceland, fiery sword, menacing looking, <laughs> menacing sword, however you want to translate it, right? Husband of Queen tomorrow. Ooh, ah, ah. Bragantini. Did David slay a man? Or is David a perfect naga just like his father and just like his son, Daniel or Killian? 
And it's Daniel Alcoon, the same Daniel that wrote the book of Daniel. And it's either captive of Nebuchadnezzar or Nebo defend my boundary or Genghis Khan. Are you surfing the way? David Sauslin, son of Preston Child. <laughs> David the first, Dewey, Dadi, Rodan. Remember the Rhoda, House of Rhoda flow we just got, right? Rhoda is the radar. King of Robotic, Gotti, Mani. Yemenak. They say alternative history, or are we talking the real thing? Or are we talking the drop? And even in this map of Australia, which we know is not the real Australia, it's Antarctica, but you see the Eber right there. You see Eber, you see Ophir, you see Kadar or Cedar. <laughs> Land of Benjamin. Whoa. What catastrophe hit in 1530 <laughs> that caused the little ice age and froze Antarctica or Tarazanta? Right. Caused a little ice age, my naga. Hebrew, Egypto, Phoenician, all that, right? Shiva or Sheba, God. Royal governor of the Rodan Empire or Mu. So now when you see the Roda. You can connect it with the moon. When you see Raiden, it's the same as Rhoda, my naga. You can connect this with the moon. David the first of Mu, king of Rabadi Gadi Mari, Reuben Gad and Manasseh, or David is the is the Khan of the northern and southern tribes. Same David, who has the same son of Hana. Just like Raja here, Raja Chola Jadara has the same son of Hana. Same Prester has the same wife, Lady Hannah. Same David the First, who has the same wife, Lady Hannah. <laughs> so Prester. Father of David Sauslin, David the First, is Prester John. Is Judah the First? <laughs> yeah. Because he has the same wife, Hannah, <laughs> and son who is Solomon. Raiden King, right? Roda, because the Raiden is the Roda. The Raida is the Roda. The Shiva is Shiva <laughs> or Shiba. 
And look what they did to Shiva. Look what they did to the queen, right? Shiva goddess, right? They turn us all into their gods and goddesses of their mythos. And look how they got her dancing. Just like young Sauceland over here. Look at it, got him dance. The dancing Sauceland, right? The dancing sheep, huh? The dancing sheep or the dancing Sauceland, you think this is play play? Now, it's a supreme goddess who they're calling Devi, which is really the Dawis. Because even the queens held the Dawi or the Diva title. The Diva is the Devi. The Devi, Panaga, is the Dewey. Uh, 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 uh. The Dewey is a title worn by male and female, but they'll change the W's to V's. <laughs> Same way they do in the Hebrew. They change the Waz to Vavs, my nigga. Hawa becomes Heva or Heya later, right? But the W changed the V's. Why's the vibes? Got it. Now you got Devi, right? <laughs> and originally you just had the Dewey. Shiba or Shiva. And again, it opens the door for all the queens, all the kings, right? Princess Dara. You got uh, Princess Limbu, right? Rubati. Now we're seeing these high Amazon queens just take center stage, man. Shiva or Shiva. Rodan or Radon? Rodan or Radon? Judah the first, husband of Lady Hannah of Ta'ama. Prester John. Husband of Lady Hannah of Babylon. David the first, husband of Lady Hannah, Queen of Tahama. <laughs> so Prester, David, Judah. All the same hit, right? Married to the same Hannah of Tahama, Babylon, and back to Tahama. Princess Tahama, Queen of Tahama. Same way they do with the with the males, they go prince or king. It's the same thing for the, in their translations. Or Lady Hannah, Babylon, Hannah, 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 wife of Judah the first. Wife of Prester John, wife of David the First or Dewey, <laughs> King of Rhoda. Are we talking the Moo? Are we just talking the Moo? Got it.
searches for an imaginary kingdom. Legend of Presser John. Ah, ah, ah. So again, when I say Kara-ism, my nigga, we just talking to Kara-Katai. Kara-Katai. And the Katai is, again, the Cathay. And the Cathay is always right here with you. Fuego. And India Superior spelled with a C or a K, right? <laughs> Cateo. This Khan was a Kara Katai. In 1098, there was not yet a division into Katai or Katan and Kara Katai. So it was all one. It was all united Cathay. The same Cathay that the and Rus, they say, is found in Cadmus. Israel is found in Cadmus, right? <laughs> We're just talking about you. We're just talking about the Arab proper, right? Don't get it confused. We're just talking Lost Tribes prom. Lost Tribes is promised land, knockers. Kara, Qatar. He said he lived in certain hills through which I passed. He went by one of these three passes between the Western and internal parts of the Middle Asia, between the Altai and the Tian Shan. In the valley between those mountains lived certain Nestorian pastor, powerful man holding sway over the people called Naaman and belonging to the Nestorians. Why do they keep saying that? Because they know. Like you know, my nigga, what that story is. They know they gotta keep it real when they talk Nestor, man. Save these links, cause we always gotta find new ones. You better save them so you know, so you know that when they talk Nestor, according to the dictionary, is a name for old king. Shout out to Bob Marley because they said that was also his name. Nestor. Old king renowned for wise counsel. Don't let him play us with his Christianity. We're talking an old king renowned for wisdom. Understand, Amma is present with David. Amma is present with Salima. Amma is present with you. Because we're talking wisdom. It's the conqueror of fortune, my name. Nestor, right? Old King, old Khan, old wise king. <laughs> so this powerful man is an old wise king or related to the Magi of the old wise kingdom, right? Karakatan, Gurkhan, Yellow Dashi, on the death of Khan Khan, the emperor of the Lao dynasty, Shalak. Um, this next story, and here we go again, old king, right, proclaimed himself a king, <laughs> and then the historians called him King John, saying ten times more about him than was consistent with the truth. Well, prove it. <laughs> prove it, man. <laughs> this is how the historians behave who arrive. So they didn't just call you Christian, they said Nestorian Christians. <laughs> Fade and shame. Are oh, we going to get on this China drop? We're about to get on this China drop. We're going to go real quick. It's going to be greatest dismount of all time. 
Oh, we back to talking Tangu, huh? And the seven tribes. Where's Tangu, my knowledge? Florida. Uh oh. Tangu, or we got Tanduke on the other side of Anion that we saw before, right? So this is Tangu Regnum or Kingdom. Tangu, India Superior, Florida, right? Mexico, Tangu. All this is the all this is you, Bhagavanga. All this is Hebrew. The Middle Asia, right? Asia is you, right? Each people had, apart from its ethnic name, a synonym, number of tribes constituting it. Thus, the Ugars or Ugars were called Tokus Ogus, nine tribes, Karluk Uk Agus, or three tribes, Basmil, 40 tribes, the Tangu, seven tribes. The Catan were an eight tribe people. Interesting, right? Seven, eight, nine, <laughs> forty. The word Nema means eight in Mongolian. So now that we know we're talking Kara, Cathay, Catan, right? Now that we know we're talking Cathay, because we're talking Cathay, yo, right? Cathay, yo. We can narrow this down in America, man. Unlike the southern and western borders, the northern limits of the Kara Katan Kingdom cannot be determined with sufficient certainty. It is generally considered that this frontier passed along the river Emil, but to the north, in the Itish Basin, the powerful tribe of the name and live, their origin and ethnic allegiance still remains an open question. The history of the name is authentically known only from the period of Genghis Khan. But what about the Prester before the invasion of the Genghis Khan? What about Unk, uh, right? I.e. from the second half of the 12th century. Well, the Prester John Letter was written in 1165. 1202 is the invasion of Genghis on Prester John in Tangu, according to the Swords of the East. There is where the solution lies. While the majority of nomad tribes in steep Asia are known to historians from the end of the 10th or start of the 11th centuries, information of the naming a very large, strong, cultivated people, in fact, appears at the end of the 12th century. And one story they say King David or the Preston was uh, slayed by one of the namings in friendly fire. In, in other words, he went there to lay low and someone didn't recognize him and took him out. That's what they say. I say he got back door. I say he got back door. Just like Dragon Canoe. We just getting bits and pieces, man. So it's, uh, searches for imaginary kingdom, but we're going to keep this link up. And we're going to take a whole lot of time with this. I just want to keep it relative because it's all relative, man. Now, when we talk chronology, just remember a couple things. And then we're going to get some drop. I'm going to play a few clips of uh, Prester 109 and another one. Just breaking down a couple things for the dismount. So, for Manko's new chronology, right? This is this uh, Russian, Russian, um, you know, he, he's, he's putting together the chronologies. <laughs> the real chronology. They say new, but it, this is way closer to what we think. For Manko's new chronology argues that the dawn of human civilization occurred about 1,200 years before present. The dawn of human civilization occurs 1,200 years ago. 
in what we consider the ninth, tenth century. That is the dawn of human civilization. Whoa. So, <laughs> back to the investigation. When we talk to Jacob and we say, uh, is this Jacob in 890 CE, AD, 960, whatever, you know what I mean? Is this the Jacob, right? <laughs> Same thing when we look at uh, Daniel Coombe, right? We say, is this Daniel 946? Is this the Daniel? Right. Because I know it's mind blasting to think. You thinking you got some antiquities, but a lot of it is forgery. A lot of it is falsified history, right? Falsified antiquity. What if, let's just surf the way, what if human civilization or Nagaville, <laughs> you know, in terms of where they are getting these writings from, right? It's just popping off, like just popping off. <laughs> It is largely based upon dates allegedly obtained through textual analysis and astronomical calculation. Now, let's talk about these time shifts again. The popular notion is that human civilization dawned maybe six to 10,000 years ago. For Manco's new chronology condenses this down to 1,200 years ago. By arguing the events of civilization let me get it bigger, man. <laughs> As we make, start making a dismount. <laughs> For Manco, Anatoly, he's condensing 6,000 years, 10,000 years into 1,200 years by saying that the events of civilization were artificially placed further back in time by shifts of roughly 333 years, 1,053 years, 1,778 years, that's 1,800 years. So they can take your real story that's happening in 900 and put it back, shift it back 1,800 years, man. Now you're in the BCs thinking King David's in the BCs and you can't connect to the BCs. You can't connect there psychologically, consciously. You can't connect there in your Ruach. It's too far. This is magic, man. This is hijack. Or they'll take something that happened in the 1800s and put it back to the year 800 or something. You know what I mean? Or they'll take something happening in 1800 and put it back in 1500. So now you got a cataclysm in 1530 that we're talking about with Antarctica. And you got a cataclysm happening in 1800s with the comb saying it. <clears throat> so the three shifts have also been listed by Fermenko as roughly 330, 1050, 1800 years. These shifts are illustrated in Fermenko's global chronological diagram. Remember these shifts, man. So you drop ain't going crazy when I'm putting this together, when I'm at least fitting things in different places, seeing what hits. That's what an investigation is. We never proclaim to have all these answers. We just proclaim that we're going to ask the right questions. You can only ask the questions by saying, hmm, does this fit here? Does this fit here? Does this fit here? That's all we've done for the last seven, eight, nine years. You know what I'm saying? Damn near 10 years so. That's why we've come came so far, because we empty our cup every time we do that. Every time we say, can I push this back a thousand years? What if I added a thousand years back to this? So if they're talking Kalelu 775 AD, what if we're talking 1775? Let's go. <laughs> El Awa, because you know they say Daniel El A Kumisi.
When was the book of Daniel really written? All this prophetic talk, right? And it's very interesting that Kirkasani really does connect with the Kirkasani. The Circassian flow, right? The Sauceland flow connects directly with this Jacob. Huh? How is it possible? The sword, the menacing look, the one with the deadly glance. How do you connect that with this Jacob? Kirkasian, right? Ancient Kirkasian. The all is the L, the Kum. Hawa rises. Hawa rises. I'm talking El Hawa, right? Remember that El Hawa drop? Yeah, Hawa, the creator. According to this great research here. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little blurry, but we could get it. We can get it. Hawa, prominent name is that of Hawa. Highly prominent name is that of Hawa, the creator. It was the most ancient name for the creator. How do you get to Yah? How do you get to Heya? How do you get to Jehovah, right? <laughs> It was the most ancient name for the creator and it is easily identified from a Hebrew verb meaning to form or to mold as time flowed on and the world fell apart or we fell off. <laughs> different people developed different names for the Father God, for the creator, king of the gods and for other superhuman personalities. The myths show common patterns but the stories and relationship among the gods vary from place to place. The tribes remember the same general arrangement, general arrangement, but not the same. We, the tribes remember the same general arrangement of Hawa, generally speaking, right? <laughs> yod hey vav hey, right? But they switched it up. They put the Y in front, acting like it was talking about some future change. Look how this researcher tries to throw us into the uh, Yahawas, right? Watch how he try to do it, too. We get the babies out the bathwater. The myths show common patterns with the stories and relationships among the gods vary from place to place. The tribes remember the same general arrangement, but the estrangement led to different details. Oral deterioration and later literary embellishments eroded a solid core of social memory. So between oral deterioration, between literary embellishments, and of course the hijack 101 <laughs> threw us off, man. We forgot Hawa. We forgot Hawa. We no longer remembered Hawa. Yeah. In chapter two, I discuss Anglo-Saxon aloha with its present form of hello. <laughs> hello, aloha is Hawa, El Hawa. And the curious parallel, the Hawaii island aloha or Hawaii, right? These greetings had strong parallels with El El. Oa or Eloha, the Hebrew name for God, El Hawa. Furthermore, as I show now, the biblical name for the personal God of Israel was Yahweh. Come on, man. Come on. 
Come on, boss. That train never late, right? <laughs> Yahweh. Yahweh's from 1869, boss. And it's the hypothetical reconstruction of the tetragrammaton. Yo, hey, wah, hey, right? Sometimes they put the V's here because they turn, they turn the W's to V's, right? Based on the assumption that the tetragrammaton is the imperfective of the Hebrew verb, hawa, earlier form of hey, right? So we're talking about the one who is the existing. So this was a hypothetical reconstruction, but they're telling you it goes directly back to hawa, which is the earlier form of hey. So if you're saying hey today, that's not the earliest form or not. You might be used to it. <laughs> you might have told everybody, hey, this is what we're going to do. But you got to empty your cup, man. Don't be silly. They changed the W's to V's. Yode Wah, hey, became Yode Vav, hey, right? Now you're speaking Yiddish. But we're talking the Ha Wa, which is the fifth and sixth letter of the Hebrew Aleph Bet. Strong power, right? Enters your house. You start to gather. You start to move through a door. You get your breath. You get your security. You get your hawa. The one who is the existing. Because you have breath and security. Secure breath means existence. And ain't no breath without security, right? You want, you want breath without security? You want security without breath, my nigga? <coughs> well, do you? <laughs> you want security with no breath? You want breath without security? So you need Hawa to get your Zion, to get your, your, your food, man, to get your, your nourishment. You need Hawa to eat. You need Hawa to eat. Not hey ya. You don't see a ya. Not Yahweh. You don't see that in the first seven letters, first six letters. You don't see that. You see it later, but that's out. That's outside the wall. <laughs> you, man, you done ate. You done built a wall. <laughs> you got your basket. Stuff is contained in it. Stuff is outside of it. Now you could talk about the worship of the creator, which is the Yod. But the Yod is not the name. They duplicated the, the Yod to mean what they're calling the creator, but that's something else. Yeah, that's something else, boss. That's not the Yod in Hebrew. <laughs> nah. They're not meaning it that way, my naga, and they're teaching you the Yahweh. They're teaching you the yod hey vibe. They're putting the Yah on it. They're putting an exclamation of defiance or dismissal on your creator, on your wa, on your security. They're saying you are defiant against your own security, your own breath. You're defiant. You're dismissing your own security with that Yah, with that Yahweh or Yahweh, because the Yahweh the wa is a way. The way is the wa. <laughs> the way is the wa. The way is the wa. So you're putting a defiance on your wa. You're putting defiance on your own security. My naga, wa. Not a ya, a wa, which is the earlier form of hey we see clearly yeah or why earlier form we still just talking 
Oh, wow. Right. <laughs> God. A while they created and they forgot about the creator, man. They forgot all about Hawa. Hawa. <laughs> but we don't forget. Because it's all in these place names. You know, it's all in our names, like Joshua Watts, all in our names, my life. Hawa. So you got a loa, a lua. You know, loa in Utah, loa in Chile. All these are variations of eloa or oa. A oa is oa, oa. Ua is oa. Like again, Joshua. Like kihawahawa <laughs> or chihuahua, right? Like agua, agua. All this is the creator's name and all these things, man. So, dodge the hijack. Again, they try to, you know, flip it up, man. Try to, you know, give you a little flip to it. But you know the truth. You got the drop. Because we see clear. El Hawa. <laughs> One of the most ancient excavated sites in Israel, El Hawa, God creator, is the key to the host of linguistic forms. While El, or all, right, Al Kum, right, Daniel Al Kum, a common Shemitic word for God or the creator, is well remembered in the Bible. Hawa, the ancient name for the creator, is not. Why don't they remember Hawaii, right? That's crazy. Why don't they remember Hawaii, which is the earlier form of Heya, Yah, Yahweh, all this? <laughs> and which Yahweh spelled backwards? Hey, hey, wa. So they always reverse our frequency that's why you got to reverse the curse you got to reverse the curse go back to the earlier go back to hawa the one who is the existing or your secure breath my nigga because once you walk through that door you get your big mama you get your breath then you get your father which is your security But you need that strong power in your house, man. <laughs> in your Ruach, God. So you can gather and tribe up, God. Get through the door, which is the portal, the vortex, to get the breath. Mama got her, her arms up. Not a man. Your mama got her arms up. Proverbs 8, she says, man, boy, you must, you must be thought as if you forgot about your breath, man. Mama says in Proverbs 8, I'm standing at the entrance, the gates, the gateway, the entrance, the door to give you that breath. Now you got your hawad so you can get your food. Don't you want to eat? You want to be nourished? You want to be cut off from the hijack city static? You, you, you want to be hijack free? You don't get no yas before your za. You get your waz before your za. God. While El, right, is remembered, Hawa, the ancient name, is not. The reason is simple. When the Israelites were given Yahweh during the Exodus, wow. So now he's saying, and this is where we dodge the hijack, that there's a new name. Did, did the creator ever say, I'm going to give you a new name? <laughs> Moses got the name, right? Exodus 3, or is it 13? And, uh, you know, <laughs> Moshe says, what do you want me to tell the people to call you? 
I am that I am. You look up that scripture again, you get Strong's Concordance 1961, which is going to bring you to Heya, which means to exist. And then you got to know, you got to go to the earlier form, right? Because they no longer remember a why. Don't fall for the hijack that you got to put a ya in front now because you got a new name. Who told you that, Hijack City? If my name is Marcus, <laughs> but because you, because I'm in the future now, future tense is the ya. Is the future tense the ya, or is the ya the name of the creator? Y'all gotta make make it make sense. <laughs> Do you put a ya on it because it's the, it's the future? You gotta change it. So now you're gonna call me ya, Marcus. <laughs> Or are you trying to say that's the name of the creator, Yah, or Defiance, right? I think you're in Hijack City. I think you need to come home to the earlier form. I think you've been given a new name, a new hijack, an excellent new tune, a frequency, a frequency switch. But you got to go home to your ancient love song because they learned to forget the old Hawa. Who told you it's an old Hawa? So you need a new Hawa or Yahweh? Nah, we dodge their Yahweh's, man. We dodge their Yahweh's, your Yahweh's. We go home to the old Hawa, right? Earlier Hawa, where we want to talk existence. H1961, Heya, earlier form, Hawa. Dodge the hijack. Allow why? Let's get it, man. Yeah. Yeah, boss. We did it again. How y'all really, man? I mean, how you really, 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 man? <laughs> For this, man. They learn to forget the old Hawa. They no longer remember Hawa. <laughs> but Hawa's are everywhere. Al Hawa is in Nigeria. Halawa is a part of the Hawaiian Islands, right? Halawa, Jordan, Halawa, and the Jebel Mountains of Sudan, where the L has shifted to all. The L has shifted to all. A L. Like Daniel Al Kun. You got Hawaii, Hawaii, Mongolia, Hawaii Island, Kuwait, Hawaii, Ethiopia, Awa. Avatar, they got Awa. And the Avatar is Awa because the W's were switched to V's. The Y's to Vav's. And the Avatar is Awata. Awata. Now you got the way of water, <laughs> Okinawa, right, Japan. Uh, the Hawaii name may also be found in Ava Island. Now they got the V's on it again, right? So you can dodge the V's now. If it's an A, it's <gasps> wow, right? Tongan Islands, South Pacific, Samoan Islands, everywhere, everywhere, boss. Hawaii is everywhere, H-U-A. H A W E A H A Y or H A W I A W A H U A H U I or H U A Solomon Islands Hawaii Hawaii You got Hawaii Hawaii Nicaragua man <laughs> Come on. The Key Hawaii Hawaii Mexico right you got the Hawaii Hawaii forms of Mexico H U E is also Hawaii Oh, I love it, man. I love it, man. I love it, man. <laughs> hey, we already won, huh? We already won. Ooh, ooh, ah. <laughs> God. All right. Let's make the, the greatest dismount of all time. 
let's see. We're going we're gonna to talk China for the dismount. We're going to talk um, yeah, yeah, Queen Tamar. And we'll see what else we got. What else we got time for, man? We'll, we'll see. As I creep back, <laughs> as I creep to the side, as I creep back in this Owaspi flow. Shout out to the cons, man. As we creep back in this Owaspi flow. You know, it gets realer and realer for a con. Y'all remember the definition of China? Shout out to getting to the root of it all, man. <laughs> Cootie Mayo, all the cons sending me links, man. Making sure we laced up with that drop. Y'all remember the Ospi Bible, right? It got a lot of craziness in it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but now we got a Dragonfly perspective. You know, I know that we're going to connect it like we never connected it before. It's been years since we've, you know what I'm saying? Got back in this Owaspi flow, so very excited. Right now, we we'll just start with the dic with the dictionary. <laughs> they got a, a little quick little Owaspi dictionary. Hopefully, we can pull this up right quick. Where it has the definition of China. Like you've never seen it before. Those that remember, you know, China is a person, right? So we see China on the mass of America. We got to take it a step further, right? Are we talking China, you know, with the CH, ch, ch or are we talking a hard K? Like a Kenna, Kana, like Canada. And if China is just Khan, <laughs> And we got to ask ourselves, you know, is China Presto John, right? Is China Presto John? Is China David? We're just talking to God. That's pretty awesome to think of China like that, though. Because we don't pronounce no ch 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 <laughs> in ancient Hebrew, it would be k k k like the ka. So now China in this Owaspi, you know, I know it's a little slow because it's, it's coming up slow. Um, is a deliverer. Deliverer contemporaneous with Moshe, meaning what drop? Yeah, we're going to get back in this this words of Jehovah and this angel ambassador. We're going to see what they're cooking on this time. <laughs> and it's a whole chapter on this deliverer or Mashiach named China. And there appears to be like four deliverers, at least three, right? There's Moses. There's the Capilia is another name for it. Capilia is also China. I love this definition here, man. It's, I love this glossary, man. It's one of my favorite <laughs> glossary dictionaries. I know it's a little uh, muffled here, but blow it up so you can see. This word right here is Algonquin, you know. I got the I got the OG, it's a little clear, but we did this before, so I remember. <laughs> but this is Algonquin, and this is the definition of Algonquin. The United States of North American Indians <laughs> before their destruction by the Christian. Damn. We on the warpath.
the United States of North American Indians before their destruction by the Christian is an Algonquin. Damn. Okay. What's China? Okay, there's Capilia. So Capilia is also a deliverer, a man of India, contemporaneous with Moses. Contemporaneous means what? That they're living at the same, around the same time. So just like you got Moses in the Hebrews, you also have a Moses of India. Now, is this the same Moses? Are they just you know, kind of tricking us in a sense, making us feel like they're separate people in separate places. Because we know something that they don't think we know, right? <laughs> we know that India, we know that India is India superior, right? So we know that we're talking America. We also know that China, <laughs> It's what Marco Polo calls Cathay is also America. Okay? We saw the Kapangu, all that stuff, right? Okay. Oh, wow. Because honestly, Khan, I can't even make this stuff up, man. For this man. So what's what what's with this China where the Chinese sell upon this ocean? We see Florida again and Cathay, C A T H A Y, or Katai, Car Katai. This is the great con of China, boss. This is the map of America. Fifteen hundreds again. Shown to King Henry in the fifteen hundreds. And here's Ptolemy's India, right? So we have India and China on the same landmass, which is North America, Florida, right? <laughs> God. And there's all kind of things, dragons and nagas popping off, gold and everything. China, India, America is the same place, originally. China, Cateo, India is America. So this is what we know that they don't know we know, right? So India has a deliverer, which is India Superior, contemporaneous with Moshe because it's the same Naga. Capilla is Moshe. And like Moses, he delivered the faith is out of bondage or the Israelites out of bondage, not by migration, but by establishing their freedom throughout India. He also wrought miracles. Wow. Capella. And there's a star named after. Then you got China, right? This is China over here. C-H-I-N-E. A deliverer, what? China. So China is a man, right? He's a deliverer like Capilia. He's a deliverer like Moses. Contemporary with Moses and Capilia. He was to China a great deliverer. <laughs> yeah. Right. China was to China or Cathay or America at the same time as Moses delivering Nagas, right? Capilia was to India at the same time as Moses delivering Nagas, freedom at the same dang time, right? 
Bangu, Japan is here, China's here, India's here at the same place at the same time. And all of their deliverers or messiahs are popping off at the same time because they're the same Preston, the same Khan. He also popped off miracles. He was an Isu by birth, which is where they're getting that Jesus flow. Because an Isu just meant like, you know, you got this righteous flow. You know what I'm saying? So the country China was named after him. Whoa. And just like JC, this is crazy. After his death, his body was reduced to ashes. Jehovah caused the wind to gather up the ashes and restore China to life for seven days. During which time he preached before the kings and the people. Then Jehovah or Hawah sent down a ship of light and bore China up to heaven like Elijah. Like Elijah. Wow. Okay, so with this wisdom, my naga, <laughs> it's funny because Christ, the definition is wisdom in the Oaspe, knowledge. Right, Mama says in Proverbs 8, I am knowledge, I am understanding, right? So they hijack Mama, right? They hijack Big Mama and turn it into JC the Christ. Now he's at the right hand. Oh, JC's at the right hand of his father. No, mama's at the right hand of Big Daddy. Big mama's at the right hand of Big Daddy. The ha is at the right hand of the wa. You know what I mean? Wisdom is the Christ, my naga. <laughs> the anointed, my naga. You can't get no more anointed than Big Mama. She says in Proverbs 8, I was created before the earth, man. Before the foundation of the earth. I was already with, with your father. Daily his delight. Daily his delight. <laughs> she was already delighting her man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Big Daddy. So, you know, it, it, it's a union popping off. Wisdom got hijacked by Christ. Got hijacked by JC. You replace Big Mama at the right hand with with Zeus, you know what I'm saying? Zeus took over Big Mama's spot. And China is a deliverer contemporaneous with Moses. Got you. Let's go. All right, so for the dismount, let's get some of this Fusang flow love to mind unveil. All to the good, man. A hop to you. Fair use. I've done enough talking. <laughs> I've done enough popping off. Let's get a few minutes of this China flow. Remember where China is. Remember who China is. You did. And then let's see if we have time for a couple of clips from the press to flow as well, man. Hey, con up, con. <laughs> we just getting started, man. It's a beautiful flow, and, you know, we really are right on time to... Bring all this to light, man, in the year of the dragon, you know what I mean? To see clearly in the year of the dracon. It's step by step over here, you know, it's no rush. <laughs> we can talk about Chief of the Fools on April Fools, man. <laughs> so, yeah, let's get it, man. Let's let this thing load up. The picture will get clear right now. It's just a little yada yada, but let's get it. Mine unveil, take the wheel. Reported his findings to the Chinese emperor. Oh man, come on, boss. This AI tool will. Hey man, AI is the alchemical serpent, man. Take your tools and get tooly with it, man. Let's go for the dismount. Here we go. There we go. Oh, wow. By Yao Salian, and it describes the civilization that inhabits the Fusong country. This Fusong, which is described by Shen, has been posited to be in the Americas. 
which is fascinating because this was a subject of great debate during the so if Fusong is in the Americas, this is why we got China popping off over here. I mean, I'm belly flopping, but let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. During the late 19th and 20th centuries, after the 18th century writings of Joseph de Guigne were republished and disseminated by Charles Godfrey Leland in 1875. There are even maps that show that there was a Chinese colony in America before Columbus. Mm. And some maps depict Fusong as an island above California near British Columbia. Mm. Others show it as a large area on the west coast. Perhaps the landmass changed following a large disaster in the early 17th century. <laughs> These early maps are extremely fascinating. And there's even a map that's dated from before the arrival of Columbus. And uh, let's go. Columbus. How would the Chinese know what North America looked like if no one had traveled there before? This seems to be a huge cover up. And in Leland's book from 1875, he lays out some interesting facts that seem to prove this theory. Quote, it is now more than a century since the learned French sinologist de Guigne set forth the fact that he had found in the works of early Chinese historians a statement that in the 5th century of our era, certain travelers of their race had discovered a country which they call Fusong, in which, from the direction and distances as described by them, appeared to be Western America, and in all probability, Mexico. Whoa. End quote. Whoa. But of course, de Guigne's work, even to the present day... That's crazy because we keep saying it's China-Mexico, right? Even on that Asia map. Even on the Asian map. Where's Asia, my nigga? Orion. It's 1531 again. Right? Because Mexico, you don't see Mexico on this map, but obviously you see it would be right around this area that's connected to South America, right around Paris, Paris, Cathay, right? Which is what Marco Polo called China, Cathay, which means pure land. So who's these Nagas of the pure land? And where's Asia, boss? And did the Chinese discover America or is this <laughs> is it China? Did the Chinese discover America or is this where the Grand Khan of China is? Like it had said in the Atlantic Monthly Journal, Volume 104. The Grand Khan of China is in Asia, and they just made up a North America, so we don't know we're in Asia, right? Or Ania, Anaya, or Ania, one letter rule. We get back to the China, but China's the man. <laughs> China's a deliverer. We remember that. Atlantic Monthly Journey Journal also talks about China being 10 days from Cuba. If we know that China over there, it's way more than 10 days on a boat <laughs> from America or Cuba, right? So they got some super speed uh, signing boats, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but remember, the Cuban monarch was at war. The Khan's great ships, he understood, came to Cuba, 10 days journey from the Chinese mainland. That Cuba over there ain't no 10 days from China, but this China here, right, is more like it. Because you could be in Cuba, you know what I mean, and be, you know, 10 days depending on your route. 
<laughs> to the mainland of Cathay, which is North America. So we just got receipts on receipts. Cathay, those Indies, where it looks to find riches. That's what they're looking for. Talking in our language, the North Coast of South America, Columbus believes he is at last located the name and kingdom of the Khan. When he was on the North Coast of South America, he believed he had located the kingdom of Prester John. <laughs> he pulled up near South America and said, oh, I must be near the Grand Khan. C-A-N, like American, or C-H-A-N, or K-H-A-N. So China's 10 days from Cuba, we know where China is. And now we know who China is. Is China, Mr. China? <laughs> is David China? Is Moses China? Is David Moshe? Take the wheel. Is a subject of commendation among scholars. Now some may think that the Chinese were not <coughs> capable of traveling such great distances, but I thought this was pretty crazy. Look at the Chinese explorer oh, Zheng He's ship compared to Christopher Columbus's Santa Maria, which they both lived and sailed at the same time. The Chinese also in mainstream history traveled great distances. Sure, they say it was just along the coast, but there have been experiments that have shown it was completely possible for them to sail from eastern China to the west of North America. Remember, so this voyage was done by Buddhist monks, and there have been artifacts found in America that point to this and are associated with the mound builders. Even some Mississippian figurines resemble Buddha, Whoa. and it is called Monk's Mound. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys remember the Grand Canyon newspaper article that discussed finding mummies in the Grand Canyon? Well, according to Kincaid, it wasn't just Egyptian artifacts, there was also a large Buddhist statue found as well, which seems like an interesting detail. Sure, the mainstream narrative is that this was all a hoax, but some of the formations in the Grand Canyon are named after temples and pyramids. There's even one that's called Buddha Temple. Why would you name it that? Seems random. Unless there's something we're not being told. Uh -oh. There's another more recent newspaper article, but this one's from the New York Times in 2003, titled Goodbye Columbus, which is based on Gavin Menzies' research of Zheng He, who landed his ships in America. Now the monks who traveled to America, or Fusong, did so thousands of years ago by Chinese accounts. But Zheng He was said to land in America in 1421, which is 70 years before Columbus arrived. I think that'd be great for its own video, but I figured I should mention it, but yeah, in the article Goodbye Columbus, Menzies claims that the Chinese were not only exploring the west coast, but also the east coast and even traveling to the center of the continent. The article also mentions a Professor Niven that found a pre-Columbian Chinese corpse in Mexico. The skeletal Hi, Jack City. Let's go. Hi, Jack City. What's your credit card debt balance? If it's ten thousand dollars or more, here are three. Man, y'all debt, y'all debt, y'all can't even repay y'all debt, man. So I don't even want to hear about no balance, cause you ain't got it, cause you ain't got it. <laughs> the Delta corpse, discovered by William Niven in 1911, was found on an altar-like structure, but it was so old that the bone. Bones were to disintegrate on touch. The skull was of a Mongolian type and the body was no taller than five feet with long arms. It wore around its neck a necklace of pearls of green jade, a substance that was alien to Mexico at the time. Beside the corpse was a seven inch higher than statue known as the Little Chinaman for obvious reasons. The figurine was clothed and decorated in a Chinese style. The visage had slit eyes and had huge rings in his ears similar to those worn by the Chinese today. On his head he wore a skull cap with a tiny button in the center, which almost exactly corresponds to the caps worn by the mandarins of the empire. The find appears to be another strong indicator of China's pre-Columbian contact with Mexico. 
Menzies also mentions a 1507 map that depicts San Francisco Bay, which is pretty good evidence as the Walsey Muller world map is the first to chart latitude and longitude with precision. The Pacific coast of America is drawn on the map, and the latitudes correspond to those of Vancouver Island down to Ecuador in the south. Mm. San Francisco yeah. and Los Angeles are depicted at the correct latitudes on the chart. But how could California be accurately depicted before the first Europeans arrived to California? Also, interestingly, the Portuguese sailor Antonio Cavao was told about early Chinese voyages to the New World when he visited China in 1555, and he noted that the Chinese were lords of the Pacific coast of America. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that the Chinese were in the West of America, even stone remains. Did you know that there's apparently a wall of China in California, and they have no idea who built it? <laughs> These are called the East Bay Walls, also known as the Berkeley Mystery Walls. Wow. They can be found in the hills surrounding the San Francisco Bay, and in some places are up to a meter high, built without mortar. There was even a History Channel video talking about lots of this stuff recently, which I thought was crazy because they're literally starting to talk about the same stuff that we're talking about in terms of early civilizations in America. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, no, they don't mention aliens. <laughs> but they were comparing the East Bay walls to certain areas of the Wall of China. Some of the oldest portions of the Wall of China have a close resemblance to the walls in California. Also, I thought this was very strange. We all know about the Chinese who built the railroads. That's a common story in American history. But I didn't know about this. There's an area in Oregon with rock walls called Ahi Diggings, also known as the Chinese Wall, which supposedly were built by Chinese miners along the Granite Creek in 1867. I don't believe this story at all. Seems like a cover up if you ask me. Then there's another China Wall in Cal. Not the one that we were talking about earlier. Completely different. And yeah. It looks very old and out of place, and supposedly over 150 years old, and they even have a plaque that talks about this. Constructed with fitted stones and no mortar. The tunnels were dug out of solid granite and it was done with back-breaking order. But I thought it was interesting that the plaque referred to Chinese miners as the Asian master builders, who left an indelible mark on the history of California in the West. Hmm. Master builders? I don't know if I believe that these Chinese immigrants were just building these railroads. The story goes that they were working around the clock, every day, all year long, for roughly four years until the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. But there's really no explanation for this wall, other than that they used the debris from digging out the tunnel. They say that it was to support the railroad tracks, but it seems unnecessary to do it this way. Close inspection of the wall shows that these rocks and the wall itself display an incredible mastership that still stands today. So we're just supposed to believe that this was done by Chinese immigrants who were treated horribly and were basically in slave-like conditions? And what's even crazier is this isn't the only one. As I was researching this, I came across another mysterious wall. This one, surprisingly, in a ghost town named Loop Loop in Washington State. Loop Loop City was the first town in Okanagan County to be planned, supposedly. There are no known pictures of the town. Let go. It's a lot going down when it. <laughs> it's a lot of, is it a coincidence? Could be something, could be nothing. But you got the recon. <laughs> All right. This loop loop was once a bustling mining settlement that had 18 businesses in several streets. All right. But this is pretty insane. There's this room in the middle of nowhere called the mysterious China. China. strange set of massive granite walls in the loop country on the side of Ruby Hill. And for some reason, people have decided to call it the China Wall. It's composed of huge blocks of granite tightly fitted with the corners perfectly squared. The largest of the 10 walls measures 80 feet long and 27 feet high. 
The second is 77 feet long and 20 feet high. Apparently there are some blocks that weigh slightly over a ton, and they expect us to believe that these massive walls were built using the block and tackle method, <laughs> that it was some random mill, and yet nothing else of the ghost town seems to really survive. Okay, but listen to this. Quote, Through the years, the massive granite walls have been shrouded in mystery and peppered with speculation. Somehow they have been linked with the Chinese. A number of local pioneers had heard that the Chinese were involved in construction of the walls. However, a sampling of the names of the Arlington Mill payroll records do not show any of the Chinese flavor. Nor does it appear that Scottish masons built the wall, which has been one of the most enduring rumors attached to the massive granite structure. The walls and the rest of the Arlington Mill were constructed by the only sort of workforce one might have expected to assemble in the raw, rugged Okanagan County of 1889. Miners, farmers, carpenters, masons, common laborers, and drivers. End quote. Okay, so the local lore is that it was the Chinese and Scottish masons we belly flopping, we belly flopping. Uh, let's get it to the presser 68, man. Presser John number 68, David the Innocent, King and Queen drop. Let go. This carpet and walked on water, so let's talk about this flying carpet as well. We got some digging to do today. Let go. We're taking it easy, but we, you know, we <laughs> definitely are enjoying the flow. Let go, man. At that wall. Let's talk clean tomorrow. Okay. Sauce. Okay. Yuri. Let's talk Sheba. In this book, the Queen of Sheba legend, literature, Lord Deborah Coulter Harris breaks down that Queen Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, and Solomon's mother Bathsheba's name are the same. She was the both the daughter and the wife to King David. So now this, what I tell y'all, when we talk. Queen Tamar, my naga, we're still talking Sheba. So when we got David and Sheba, when we got David and Sheba, right, when we got Tamar, when we got Tamar, right, who's who this Yuri or Uriah was uh, arranged to be wed to, married to, This Tamar, you know, she had to piece him out because he tried to do a military coup. You know, he tried to overthrow the kingdom, man, right? <laughs> he tried to overthrow the kingdom. I'm just looking at these dates because, you know, it says 1213 is the death of Tamar. 1202 is when Genghis Khan invaded Prester John, which I think he went head up with David Sauslin because they said... David's son or Prester's son might have been the one that got slain. So did David Sosling get slain? And did she pass like 10 years later? You know what I'm saying? Like, what's that connection like? When we talk to Mar the Great, who is the wife of David Sosling, well, we're still talking Sheba. So David and Sheba in the Bible, in the, in the scriptures, is still at play in terms of the phantoms and duplications because they took your story and they dropped it off in the timelines. They took your story and they dropped it off multiple times back in the timeline. Hold up, man. I know we're getting... Uh, I'm getting droppy right now. I know we're getting pressed to 68. Right quick, right quick. <laughs> right quick, but not. I just want to belly flop right quick to 
press the 109. Just talk timeline. I just want to, you know, go back to this Anatoly for the Manco flow. See how this works, man. I can see how this all comes together. Before they dropped you off in the BCs, right? Mm-hmm. In, in the Dark Ages, before they pushed your history to the BCs, before they dropped you off in the BCs, For the man go, for the man go. Get it, uh, Before they dropped you off in the BC, it's right. Only with the help of mathematical statistics can we have a truly Oh yeah. So we gotta add the math up. If we don't add the math up, it ain't gonna make no sense, man. Math gotta be math, man. For the man go divide the world, history of the world at certain points, every era's detail. All right, so periods which had similarities were moved to be simultaneous on the time scale. This is the methodology of Anatoly for the man go to show how much overlap there is in traditional chronology of historical events for the man go assign each time interval a letter. For example, the era of the second Roman Empire was marked by the letter K. This same letter was used to mark as duplicates. Duplicates for the man had discovered. Other historical periods as well as their duplicates were identified by other letters, for example, C and P were also marked on the map. Uh, come on, my naga. Methodologies. <laughs> so a structure, a structure emerges that shows both the time axis and repetitions of historical events. This map was named Global Chronological Map. That it that is it shows what should be the true chronology of historical events. It became apparent that in the traditional chronology there are three major time shifts. Not just one boss, not two. There are three major time shifts by approximately three hundred years, one thousand years, and eighteen hundred years. How did Daniel get to the BCs? How did King David get so ancient to you? How did King David con down weed? Because you've been a long time without a, a con, right? Hosea 3. It's been a long time before you had any type of royal royalty, right? It's been it's been a long time since you've seen a, a royal regal Negro. <laughs> you see presidents and vice presidents. I hope they wear their nice little monkey suit. I hope they got their their certain tie. I hope they all pressed up. You look nothing like what you're supposed to look like. They didn't change your identity. You ain't seen no royalty, boss. Your suit and tie ain't royal, man. You ain't seen no realities. You think the you think the royalties in Britain? You think that's the royal family? You must be thoughtless. Because <laughs> they done shifted your time at least three major time shifts. That's major, boss. Imagine them taking your story today and shifting it back damn near 2,000 years. 2,000 years. And they said such and such is popping off in 23 AD. 
You would not connect to it, boss. You would say that was in 23 AD. Oh, shit. Ain't got nothing to do with me. That was 2,000 years ago. Psychologically, that's what happens. But it took place very recently, like 1800s, like early. Like it just happened. All this just happened. And if you realize they shifted time a thousand years, then 1800 years should be mind blowing. Even 300 years will mess you up. Because you think it's happening in the 1600s when it's really popping off in the 1900s. That's major. Mm -hmm. they, talk, they talk about the Rodney King situation. Say that was 1600s, boss. You'd be like, all right, that's some history, I guess. Huh. When you say it just happened, it's like, whoa. So that, that happened to my grandparents, great grandparents. Three major time shifts, 300 years. And the reality is 333 years, 1,053 years and eight, or excuse me, 1,778 years, almost 1,800 years. God, God. I just need you to dig on this. God, and lots yeah. of real historical events of the Middle Ages were copied on paper by medieval chroniclers and sent into the past. <laughs> How could this happen? Uh -oh. No, it wasn't no unintentional mistake. This was an intentional hijack. God. They purposely hijacked you. Scaliger and Batavius take the four ancient chronicles. They all describe the same events that occur. All right. I need you to really focus, man. <laughs> sister, I need you to focus. Aqua, my sister, I need you to focus right quick. You don't get nothing else out of this. Get this right here. Just tell the babies, go go fall back. <laughs> Pause the video until you're ready to really see clearly and understand what's happening. Let's go. I need you to understand what's happening. Take the four ancient chronicles. They all describe the same events that occurred, for example, in Europe. <clears throat> They said Europe in the 1400s. I say America in the 1400s. Wow. 1492, Columbus find you. Cut. So they talking 1400s. We talking 1400s. Cut. Well, remember what they just said, the same event, right? Ancient Chronicles is just history, right? So they all describe the same events that occur. Same event, my nanya, not something like it. The same event, my nanya. But when you read these articles, what they say, his father, Isaac, we're talking about Jacob. Uh, Kirk and they're going to say the sequence of his name implies that he was called Jacob, his father Isaac, and his son Joseph, reproducing the sequence of biblical patriarchs. Or, <laughs> or, we found one of the duplications in Phantom. But when did it take place? Was it actually taking place when they say it was taking place? In the first half of the 10th century, that would be before 950. What does genie.com got to say about this? I don't know if I put Kapisani in the genie.com. <laughs> Birdman hand rub. <laughs> it's getting ju it's getting spicy around here, man. <laughs> it's getting too spicy around here, man. It's getting too real for the feel, man. <laughs> I'm having too much fun, I say, man. I got that glow because I'm doing what I love. And can't no one take that away. That's right. If you like the hopscotch, if you like the double dutch, then double dutch, my noggin, you know what I'm saying? And that glow you feel is your glow. God, God. Anybody hating on you because you double dutch so often and so well, uh, 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 uh. they're just a hater, man. They're hater. coming over to you, your circle, 
your spiral, where you double dutching at, you popping off, man. <sighs> Haters gon' <gone> hate. <laughs> now let's get back to this vibration. It's dope that we can vibrate in 109 and 68. Talking the Battle of Davids. Now let's talk quick tomorrow now that we can dodge the hijack timelines for the dismount. This author wants to throw, not only do we got <laughs> adultery and murder, but now we got incest too, right? So now, instead of Queen Sheba being a title, and any of David's daughters will be Sheba's, because his wife is a Sheba, but this author can't connect that. Ah, no, nah. they see one Sheba, and this one Sheba has to be both daughter and wife. Come on, man, that's Hijack City. And like my real one said, we laugh in the face of Hijack Hijack City. You got King David, who needs to do what? Kill a man to get a, a beautiful Sheba? Mm. Come on, bro. Or did it happen the way this Queen Tamar Sheba happened with this David Sauce? That they were childhood friends, that they had already had a connection, that it was already popping with it, you know what I'm saying? And that this Yuri rebelled against the Queen of Sheba and all of Israel. But in the script, you got Uriah, who, you know, you don't know much about. And they try to make him a saint in that one period of him not wanting to go back to the battlefield. And, or, I mean, you know, not wanting to, to lay with his wife because he had, you know, people on the battlefield still. And he, he felt bad doing anything, you know, but he still ends up getting drunk. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hey, I mean, look. Uh, God. It appears to be inverted, man. Just to turn David into a murderous, you know, slanderous heathen, you know what I'm saying? Same as they're trying to make him some incest with daughter and wife. You got to dodge to hijack, Jose 3. You're searching. You're searching. We're searching. According to Ellis, Bathsheba's firm name was Makah Tamar. She was David's daughter by her namesake mother, Maka Tamar. So the Tamar title and the Sheba title are one and the same. That's the drop. Let's go. That's the drop. It's the same thing. Okay. Let's get some more comments. It's the same thing. <laughs> I want to go specifically on that particular drop. Belly flop. Does it mean you take what Google says about David or what? Baby belly flop. Let's go. Including Daniel, Benjamin, Yeshai, who is David's father, and Amron, who is Moses' pops. And you see how closely related this Jesse is with Jesus. All you got to do is change the ES around. Uh oh. Uh oh. Belly flop. You know what I'm saying? Or murder. They put him out of code immediately. <laughs> they do whatever they can to muddy the water. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin and it seemed impossible for Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a, had a friend whose name was John Adab the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, and Jonadah was a very crafty man, and he said to him, O son of the king, why are you so haggard, haggard morning by morning? Would you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadah said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill, and when your father comes to see you, say to him, let my sister Tamar come and give me bread and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat. From her hands, so whether you're talking this tomorrow story or the Genesis story with Judah, and then Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, Shua, Hawa, Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son and called his name Ur, she conceived again and bore a son and called his name Anah, and again she bore a son and called his name Shelah, Shelah. Judah was in Kazad when she bore him. And that goes on to talk about 
you know what I'm saying, this Tamar that plays the harlot and, you know, does all that, right, that we talked about. So that's just some Tamar drop, you know, letting you know how they switching the frequencies on the priest queens and the priest kings. When you talk about this Yuri, let's talk about Yuri. Did Yuri rebel against Israel? Let's talk Uriah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Got that wall. Now, this part right here is talking about the union of Tamar and just how far they really went back. This Sheba, remember, because the Sheba. Queen of Sheba, Solomon's mother, Bathsheba's name are the same. Bathsheba's name is, her firm name is Maka Tamar. Bathsheba, Tamar. Bathsheba, Tamar. Bathsheba's name is Tamar. Thank you, Deborah Harris. Let's go. Let's get it. Put this by. Don't be getting leaky. <laughs> we are getting leaky. Let go. We can get a little more thinking. Easy. Which one on one? Let's get this one. Okay, okay. So she recovered from her Emotional wounds. What emotional wounds, right? That was with Uriah or Yuri. And she is trying for a second time to find happiness in marriage. Who became her new chosen one? This this was a familiar person, a person familiar to her from early childhood, whose name was David. He was the son of the Ascetian king, and like Tamara was brought up by the Rusa die. And that's what we got last time. In Genie, we, we surfed that wave, get it in 67. It's matching up perfectly. The Sheba and David. Bathsheba, right? It wasn't like he just saw her. She ain't his daughter. None of that shit, right? This is a woman that he's already known. Some historians claim that Queen Tamar fell in love with him as a girl. They were already a situation, man. But one thing is clear to us, their marriage was extremely happy and harmonious. Since then, the name Tamar has been closely associated with the name <laughs> David. Thanks to him, Tamar won all the most high profile victories. So David and Sheba were fighting side by side, conducted brilliant battles, she herself did not participate in the battles. This is not a female matter, but faithful field marshal Zachary and beloved husband David led the troops, and Queen Tamar was the inspirer of victories. Such a tandem was invincible. Now, she didn't participate in them victories, but what victories did she participate in? Now it says Yuri did not accept the divorce. So this is after Yuri, you know, was going against the tribe. He gathered a huge army. So this Uriah here, unlike the script, you're seeing a reason for why they had to ride on Ur Uriah. <laughs> you did. He gathered a huge army from the Greeks to which some Georgian Tsarina's ill wishers also joined and set off to conquer Georgia, which is connected with the tribes of Israel. All right, this time Tamar herself led the troops. So Front just because she didn't help out later after the union of David, maybe she stopped fighting in these particular wars. God you know what I'm saying? After the union with David, maybe she was able to fall back a little bit. 
You know, what I'm you know what I mean, she had to fight on the front line for a reason, man. And then when she didn't have to, she didn't have to, my nigga. Nah, this is what the King Consort thing is all about. Let go. Same, but before that, Tamara herself led the troops, showing remarkable talent for the commander and defeating her husband on the outskirts of Tbilisi. Bang. So Tamar led the troops and defeated her husband, Yuri. In the script, you got David putting him on the front lines and all this stuff, right? <laughs> but Bathsheba or Tamar and David were already in love. And this arranged marriage happened, you know what I'm saying, by their families, Yuri's father and Tamar's father and them. And then Yuri ended up turning on the whole tribe. And back to this Yuri, you know, situation. And go back and get that story with David Bathsheba, Uriah. Supposedly he killed a man, right? Because he put him on the front line and he, Uriah supposed to have died. But, and then uh, Uriah came back, right? Got drunk and, uh, you know, was in front of uh, the door, you know what I mean? And didn't want to go lay with his wife because, you know, yada, yada. So, <clears throat> um, oh no, well, that happened before. I mean, so he was drunk, yada yada, and then he got put on the front lines, and that, that's what happened. So they had this whole drinking thing going on. And here you got Yuri. It says he was one tough nut. True, he led the troops, won victories, but drank, cursed, and self willed for more than two years. So this is a different look at this Uriah, but the Similar thing is this drunkenness, is this drinking situation. <laughs> Both of them drank. <laughs> and in this case, um, you know, it was Bathsheba, you know, taking down Yuri with the help of David Sauce. Hmm. Let's get it. Yuri would become a pawn in their hands. The Russian prince turned out to be a tough nut. True, he led the troops and won victories, but drank. Right? Remember? They say David got him drunk. <laughs> okay, yeah. you see in the parallel. Uh -huh. Cursed and self-willed for more than two years, so that soon everyone was bursting with patience. They poured him a full measure of gold and sent him royally back to the Byzantine. Yeah, gold and everything. When it talks about these Byzantine kings and the Persian shawls, these shawls are like the Khans, and this is why you got this Shervan shawl drop. Okay, what it is, man. Because the same Shervan shawl lines up with who? Manu Chir or Makir <laughs> Shaw mm. Shervan, who is the husband of who? Princess Tamar. Uh oh. Daughter of another David, David the Fourth. David the David Sauslin that we're reading about that she fell in love with is David the Sixth, carrying that title. So this is the same Princess Tamar. <laughs> who's supposed to be married to David Sauslin, right? And this looks like a Persian duplication phantom of the same thing. The Khan is the Shah, but now they're calling him Manu Kir or Amakir Flow for the dispatch. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> We got that. <laughs> we got that. We got that. We got that water. Hey, man, I can't make this stuff. Water. <laughs> hey. Trap Nation. Trap Nation got that water. Trap Nation got that water. We out of here, baby. Woo. This is a full speed drop right here. Fully loaded. I really pray you enjoyed it, man. Um. It took me five, six times to record it. They kept 
jamming me up, man. But I stay with it, man. Uh, I'm gonna go get some, uh, you know, some high quality H2O and get some rest. <laughs> but I don't wanna get out of here without just remembering a couple of things. One. You are awakening. You are returning, my night. You're the dragon. April 8th, comet, right? <laughs> a left in the sky, towel in the sky for Israel's return. End of captivity. End of solitary, my night. Because we've been without a king, without David. But now we've returned. And now we are KTC, which means we're seeking the creator, seeking the code, seeking the commandments, the ordinances, the statutes, seeking our conduct. We, who is one shepherd, Ezekiel 37, right? One shepherd, one king. And shall come trembling unto Hawaii. And his goodness, that land, the fat of the land, your, your breath, your security, mama, daddy, frame of shape. When? Right here. <laughs> right now. Right here. <laughs> right now. The cool say, comment, let you know it's time, my name, to return. Book of Daniel. What did this man? <laughs> Triple disc bad. Let's get it. And now that we've searched it out for quite a while, we can read this with a dragonfly perspective and say, is this gang is con kidnapping <laughs> Daniel David's bomb? Right. Is this gang is con kidnapping kill it? Because he is one of four Israelites who died without, without sin. No blemish, right? Let's go for the dismount. In the third year of the reign of Joe King, King of Judah came Nebuchadnezzar, Nebo, defend my boundary. Genghis Khan, <laughs> king of Babylon unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. Think about this in terms of Genghis Khan. Let's go. And Hawa gave Joe king, king of Judah, into his hand and with part of the vessels of the house of Hawa. And he carried them into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. His God, right? His God, right? Genghis is God, right? To this day, they got their own gods, acting like we all got one God, one power. Nah, man, y'all got your own, the same one. And the vessels he brought into the treasure house of his God. And the king spoke unto Ashpenaz, his chief officer, that he should bring in certain of the children of Israel and of the seed royal. So they're asking not only for an Israelite, but for a royal See who is Daniel by Naga, who is Kilian of the nobles, who is Daniel, who is Kilian, youth in whom was no blemish, but beautiful to look on, right? Perfection, right? <laughs> who is Kilian? Who died without sin? Who is perfection? Who is Daniel? And is this Daniel al -Kum, right? Right here, right now.
no blemish but fair to look on, skillful in all wisdom, skillful in knowledge, discerning in thought. And such as had the ability to stand in the king's palace. You can't stand in the king's palace, Managi, if you are not a noble. <laughs> and you don't get no more noble than to be the son of David, king of Israel. Who <laughs> died without sin. The nobles, youth with no blemish, perfect, right? Wow. The wow. The wow. wow. And he should teach them that the learning, the learning in tongue of Chaldean. So here we go. We got to hijack Daniel, right? And the king appointed for them a daily portion of the king's food and the wine which he drank that they should be nourished three years, and at the end thereof they may stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, which looks a lot like Hanah. And just like Daniel was David's bond, David's son, well, what would that make Hanah? Because Preston John has a son, Hana, David has a son, Hana, but not. Hey. David has a son, Hana. Or are we talking Hananiah? So. I'm asking the right questions, right? Did Daniel get locked up with his bro? <laughs> Is Hananiah the brother of Daniel? And are they both the sons of David? Did Nebuchadnezzar, did Genghis Khan take multiple bonds? Multiple sons? Hanan and Daniel? Mishael and Azariah? And the chief of the officers gave names unto them, and to Daniel he gave Belshazzar, right? And to Hananiah, Shadrach, and Mishael, Meshach, uh-huh, Meshach, and Azari, Ab Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's food. All right, all right. So So Daniel's not eating. <laughs> Daniel had an understanding of visions and dreams. At the end of the day, verse 18, which the king had appointed for, for bringing them in, the chief of the officers brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar or Genghis Khan. And the king spoke with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king in all matters of wisdom and understanding. So Hawaii was with Daniel. So this is his process of being raised up to the exilarch, Daniel al -Kumisi, which is what Anand didn't like, but Hawa was giving him Baruch. And Anand, you know, <laughs> made himself exilarch, right? So the king inquired of them. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his realm because you're talking to Preston's son, who was perfect, right? Perfection of his father, Killian. And Daniel continued even until the first year. King Cyrus. Chapter 2. Wow. The second year in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. And the king commanded to the, call the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they 
came and stood before him. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. My spirit is troubled to know a dream. So he wanted to get the answers. No one had to drop. So they had to go get Daniel. Then Daniel went in, verse 16, and desired of the king that he would give him time that he might declare unto the king the interpretation. So you get the drop because he's going to break down the kingdom. I'm just showing you what happened. All right. So he's going to break down the dream. Verse 44. In the days of those kings shall a wall of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, but it shall stand forever. Verse 45. For as much as thou saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that he broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great Hawa has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain. And the interpretation thereof sure. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel. Whoa. He didn't know he didn't know who to worship. He didn't know what to do, right? <laughs> What happened to his God, right? So even Genghis Khan had to come correct, man. And this is why Daniel was raised up to be the head, the leader during this Babylonian captivity and commanded that they should offer an offering of sweet odors unto him. The king spoke unto Daniel and said, of a truth it is that your God is the God of God. That's <laughs> right. Wow. Oh, wow. And the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets. See, now has been able to reveal this secret. Verse 48, then the king made Daniel great. What? The king made Daniel great. What? The king, Nebuchadnezzar, made Daniel exilar. Wow, just like Daniel al Kumisi, right? And gave him many great gifts. Daniel Kum means to rise. He was raised up. The king made Daniel great. Genghis Khan made Daniel great in his house, right? And gave him many great gifts and made him to rule over the whole province of Babylon. So you got Exilark, David Sausland, of Babylon, right? <laughs> God. But David's bond was then raised up as Exilark in the court of Genghis Khan. He made him rule over the whole province of Babylon, even the Hebrews, of course. So he was raised up by the king of Babylon, but the people, they wanted their own exilar. And this became a schism in the house of Israel. They said, how is this hijacked king going to proclaim you king over us, exilar over us? So Anon. His bro <laughs> made himself exilar and went against this whole reign, this whole situation. Now, wow. And I said, no, nah, we ain't playing that uh, Babylonian exilar thing, man. <laughs> I'm anti rabbinical I'm the exilar. <laughs> and to be chief prefect over all. All the wise men, or the Hebrews, of Babylon. 
And Daniel requested of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel was in the gate of the king. And that's how Daniel <laughs> became Azalar. We're talking ancient Kirkusim. Jacob, son of Isaac. Which connects to the Sauslands. The Dawi Sauslands flow. Daniel El Kumisi. Ben Moshe was a perfect man. Was the perfection of his father. resembled David in every way. And like they say, little is known about Daniel's life. <laughs> but they know he's on call. And he has some differences. He dissented from what Anana with the Kara, Katai, Kara is when they, someone had to, you know, rule the Kara Katai. Now, is it going to be the Exilarch that the king of Persia, Babylon chooses, or is it going to be the, the one the people are choosing? And that, I mean, you know, that's what it is to this day. with the Nagas that the hijack is making our leaders and all our movements, they always choose our leaders, right? Cointel Pro, they always choose our leaders behind the scenes. They, our leaders always work for them, right? <laughs> and we know Daniel was different, you know, but at the same time, that's how they viewed it. Any Naga that claims himself a leader is already going to get hated all right. So it's the same thing today, man. The Wada for tuning in to the 134th installment of the Prester John Investigation. Hawa is the God of gods. <laughs> Even Genghis Khan had to reveal the truth. He had to fall to his face in the presence and the hijack will fall to their face in your presence, my naughty. As we make our exodus <laughs> in the year of the Drakan. <laughs> we'll say it's common as return, Israel's return at the same time, right? X marks the spot, is our town. And it's right on time. 
Keber is Heber is Quavera. <laughs> and it's right here. China is David is the Preston. And he's right here, my knock. Ain't no stopping us now. Ain't no stopping this wall. Cause Drop Nation, Drop Nation, Drop Nation got the wall. Shalom to the Khan Dynasty, man. I am humble in your presence. I'm humble to pop off with you, to be a part of this wave and this understanding with Ama. You know, filling us with the breath every time. Hawa, our security, keeping us, you know, able to swim and not get wet, man. By Hijack City. No matter how much they spray, no matter how much they poison, we rise above. Wow. Oh, wow. We we cool. Say it with me, my naga. Cool, 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 my naga. Keep rising. Stay up. Suit up. <laughs> Choose a drop nation. <sighs> Wow! Loud, pop off.